Welcome to the February meeting of the WCEP general membership meeting. Um, I'm the uh, new chair, Teresa Reed of the WCEP. Um, I want to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, Washtenaw County occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabek of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Bodawatomi. The Washtenaw County Democratic Party recognizes historic indigenous communities in Michigan and those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. Washtenaw County occupies the ceded, uh, I'm sorry, occupies land ceded in the 1807 Treaty of Detroit. We further recognize the ongoing relationship of and dependence upon and respect for all living beings of earth, sky, and water. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. It's Black History Month, and we're thrilled to have a meeting filled with Michigan-based African-American leaders, unelected and elected. In addition to the panelists who've already been announced, which include Sheriff Jerry Clayton, Circuit Court Judge Arianne Slay, Chair of the County Board of Commissioners and Vice Chair of the WCDP, Justin Hodge, and Ypsilanti Mayor, Nicole Brown. Uh, we're thrilled to welcome the Speaker of the Michigan House, 10th District Representative Joe Tate this morning. Um, I'm gonna leave full introductions to Loretta Codrington, who's co-chair of the Programs Committee, um, who's pulled this program together. Uh, I wanna acknowledge that um, Loretta's had the mighty assistance of her co-chair, Eli Nathans, um, and co-chair of Outreach and Community Engagement, Kathy Wyatt. Thanks to all of you guys for bringing us this really impressive program. Before we get started today, I want to give you two organizational updates. One is around um, the incident with Justice Bernstein in January. Uh, many, many of you know about this, but I'm going to just give you a quick, I hope it's a quick summary. It looks like a lot of words. I'm going to try to make it quick. Uh, many Democrats across the state were outraged when uh, Michigan Supreme Court Justice Richard Bernstein lashed out at one of the first hiring decisions of the newly appointed Justice Kyra Bolden, who is the first African-American woman on the Michigan Supreme Court. We campaigned hard for both of these candidates. We featured them in programs um, and on the front of the 2022 Voter Guide um, we would have been outraged in any case, but we really, really put our uh, shoulder to the wheel to elect both of them. Justice Bernstein was angry about Justice Bold Bolden's hiring of an attorney named Pete Martell as a law clerk. Um, the background of Mr. Martell, he served 14 years in prison uh, from two 1994 to 2008 after being convicted of armed robbery. Uh, in which he fired at pursuing off police officers. Um, while in prison, he began to reflect on the impact of his crimes on others and began studying law and advising other inmates. And when he left prison, he enrolled as a law student at Wayne State University. And he's currently a PhD student in um, Michigan, University of Michigan's Ford School program in public policy and sociology. He's been very, he's worked very, very hard, including at the State Appellate Defender's Office. When Justice Bernstein was asked by a reporter about Mr. Martell's hiring, he told the reporter he thought it was disgusting, these are quotes now, uh, that he was no longer speaking with Justice Bolden. He said they have no values in common and that he was intensely pro-law enforcement. Um, there's an uproar and the executive board chose to write to Justice Bernstein privately rather than a public um, announcement because we didn't want to give fodder to Republicans, frankly. I'm sorry this is being recorded, but we didn't want to give fodder to Republicans with Democratic Party infighting. But I want you to know that we wrote to Justice Bernstein on January 10th, uh, condemning his behavior as juvenile um, at, at the best. Um, tainted with racism and sexism as well. And furthermore, his reaction set up a false choice between being pro-law enforcement and supporting redemption. We reminded Justice Bernstein that the MDP platform states um, a sp strong support for redemption and compassionate reentry 
for former prisoners and reminded him that many law enforcement personnel and agencies are devoted to redemption and reentry. Um, so several of us met with Justice Bernstein two, what, 11 days after we sent him this letter. He asked for the meeting after we said, we need to hear from you. So the people who met with him were the officers um, and co-chairs of outreach who are Mary Hall Sham and Kathy Wyatt, leaders uh, and leaders of the WCDP Black Caucus, Caroline Sanders, and um, of the uh, Eastern Washington Dems, that's Crystal Light. Uh, we met with him in person on January 21st. Uh, in that meeting and in a follow-up letter, uh, we insisted that he begin to learn uh, to demonstrate understanding and to earn our re-endorsement by meeting with leaders of two local organizations who support re-entry, A Brighter Way and Supreme Felons. Um, and I, not just support it like with words, but they work with people who are re-entering society and support them in successful re-entry. Re um, we insisted also that he actively support their work as well as learn from them and vocally and tirelessly support the election of Justice Kyra Bolden in 2024. He's pledged to do all that and we are maintaining a wait and see um, approach. Um, and I think we'll have time for questions after this. My second um, uh, organizational announcement is that we are engaged in a rigorous process of strategic planning. Um, we all feel strongly that our work is very serious. We're not here to play. We're here, well, sometimes we want to play, obviously, but we're here to work to maintain our majorities in um, the Michigan legislature, and which are slim, as you know, and also to, to hang on to all of our executive positions. Um, we're happy with Michigan right now, but we know that it, it's fragile. And we also nationally, it's it's rarely been more frightening. I don't think it's ever been more frightening in my lifetime. And as you can tell, that's been a long time. Um, we've been helped in our uh, strategic planning by Michelle Pallas, who is a founder of the Liberal Leadership League and Statewide Indivisible Michigan and other progressive groups. Uh, we've met 10 hours over two weeks, the last two Sundays, Justin Hodge this morning says, I'm so glad we're not meeting for strategic planning all afternoon tomorrow. Me too. Um, Michelle helped us with no pay, no compensation at all, put in hours and hours of time inside the room and outside the room um, and travel time. And I think I speak for the entire board when I say we have really benefited tremendously from her guidance. Um, so I'm thrilled we're all, all the committees are working on goals. We have a form for our goals and when we're going to be um, achieving those goals. And we'll be putting all that together in a full plan with a clear statement, to my knowledge, for the first time of our vision, mission, and values. And we'll be able to share most of that with you next month. So that's, um, that's the organizational updates. Yes, do you think we have a minute for questions? Does anybody have questions? We have time. You're you're good. You you have more time. So yeah, if there's questions, please um put them in chat the to, or raise your hand. Yeah. I also want to introduce Felicia and address hi Felicia and address the horror of the last week. Any questions? Do you have any questions in chat? I see nothing. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead. Um, so it's so it's uh, Black History Month. And this first month of the year, we have been harrowed by um, two more police killings of innocent, young, irreplaceable black men. And I think that this has this has traumatized, I think, most people who are paying attention. And well, let me say most all Democrats. <laughs> um, and but nobody more than people of color. And I so I invited Felicia um, to speak to that. Felicia Brabeck is not only a state representative, she's also a clinical psychologist and uh, also has done really important work. For us last term, so this term, there's a chance of its passage on um, 
reforms to policing. Um, so I've invited Representative Brayback to speak with us about coping with re-traumatization and potential solutions of least constructive steps we can take uh, to rein in out of control police brutality. Um, and I've also invited Senator Jeff Irwin um, to also speak to uh, whatever he wants to. I was thinking about his work on recent work on food insecurity, but um, he also is interested in speaking about police reform. So with that, I turn it over to you two wonderful people. Teresa, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Justin, did you want to? Oh, yeah. No, yes. no, no, we're good. At, let's uh, go ahead, Felicia. Are you sure? Okay. I'm sure I'm on the panel. I can talk during the panel. <laughs> Realize that after I tested Justin at 11 o'clock last night, asking him to be speak right now. I <laughs> said, oh, shoot, he's on the panel. Justin, a hardworking man, just talk all the time, please. All right. <laughs> Felicia. Well, thank you. Uh, to all of you for having us here today. Um, uh, you know, Jeff and I have both worked on these issues. Uh, this isn't just something new, uh, unfortunately. I mean, this is something that, um, you know, our country has been plagued with for centuries. Uh, and so we're just seeing the current iteration of this. Uh, and Teresa talked about uh, this a little bit Uh so, I, you know, I was just pausing because I was just thinking about, you know, do I start with the logistics or do I start with kind of the impact, um, uh, you know, after Mr. Nichols, you know, the video came out um, and um, I'm going to start with the emotional impact. Um, so last Saturday, I can tell you that um, the executive members of uh, your Michigan Legislative Black Caucus, we all got together for an emergency meeting. Uh, to talk uh, about uh, about this, you know, next senseless death, uh, and you know, we started right, by just sharing with one another and being in a space where we could talk about how we felt uh, and uh, and what it was like again to be in this position uh, after trying to to continue to to fight for things from our positions um, that we have, uh, and it is overwhelming. I know a lot of us and uh, Senator Erica Geis, who is the chair of our Michigan Legislative Black Caucus, spoke about this because we had a press conference on Tuesday about this um, that both Jeff and I were at, um, that the the weight on us as Black legislators uh, feels really great. Um, and, and, you know, being in the majority uh, is wonderful. And, and we also hope um, that we're going to be able to get uh, a really grounded, reasonable bill package around police reform passed. Um, and, but it's also um, uh, pretty harrowing to think about some of the, the hurdles that we might have um, when we try to do that. And so uh, this is a, a really heavy time for all of us. Uh, and um, particularly my black colleagues. And, and so we are, you know, know that the MLBC, the Michigan Legislative Black Caucus is actively working on this. Uh, last year we had in the house, we had a package, a 16 bill package called justice for all. Uh, it was led by then representative Tanisha Yancey. Tanisha is now a judge in uh, Detroit. Yeah. And so um, Tanisha led us uh, in a, like I said, a 16 bill package that covered um, a number of things, um, ending qualified immunity, banning chokeholds, uh, no knock warrants, the prohibition, the prohibition on purchasing military grade weapons, um, de-escalation training, implicit bias, which um, Jeff, I don't want to step for you, but, but you did the same in the Senate. Jeff was our partner in the Senate uh, on that. Um, duty to intervene policies. Uh, and one of the other ones that folks may not know is right now there's a, an information gap uh, so that if a uh, if an officer, if there's misconduct or uh, the result of an investigation around misconduct, uh, that that now has to be 
reported to MCOLs or the Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards. Uh, and then that data has to be made uh, public. Um, so what can happen now is um, if there is misconduct, um, uh, officers can go to a different uh, municipality um, and they might not know about previous behavior. Uh, and so I know that uh, now Senator Sarah Anthony was very vocal about that. Uh, so there are a number of, of bills uh, that went both in the Senate and the House. Uh, unfortunately, because of the constellation of our legislature uh, last session, they did not go anywhere. So obviously, the hope from many of us, including Jeff and I, is that it's very different uh, this session. Uh, and you know, we're all working to you know, get those bills, review them. Um, get them to a place that we want them and to also look to see now with this different constellation, is there more that we could and should be doing? Uh, and so I think that, that those are things that we're, we will continue to look at um, and particularly want to think about the impacts and you know, are there bills that, that we can develop that also um, help at least a little bit address some of the impacts? I mean, Teresa talked about this in the trauma uh, that uh, that is felt every time this happens. And the secondary trauma from all of us who um, are, who view this, I, I have to share with folks that um, it is, it is so overwhelming uh, to me that I have not been able to watch the video yet. Like it is just, it's too overwhelming. Um, and, um, and so I've had conversations with folks, uh, about it, but, um, it is, uh, I mean, it, it brings tears to my eyes. I, it's emotionally, it is just so challenging and difficult to see again. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're thinking about secondary trauma. Uh, uh I'm really aware of generational trauma and how, how this keeps happening over and over and over again and what are we doing to put an end to this uh and the other things that i'm thinking about are you know the the perpetrators of this violence and uh our colleague representative stephanie young out of detroit when she spoke at the press conference if you haven't looked at the press conference um you, you, I, you might want to check it out it, it to stephanie young's comments were so powerful. She was talking about from the perspective of, uh, you know, obviously being a legislator, but also um, a mom to two young black adults, male. Um, and, <clears throat> and um, you know, she was saying that, you know, she believes from her perspective that um, the folks who perpetrated this, you know, basically didn't go to work and, you know, intending to do this. And so what's, you know, what's happening? Uh, and you know the psychologist, the psychologist part of me, as I was standing there, was you know overwhelmed, you know, with thinking about uh, groupthink and bystander apathy. You know the things that when things happen, <clears throat> excuse me, when things happen, bad things, and people are watching it, that other folks think, well, someone else is certainly going to step in. Someone else will do it. It's not it doesn't need to be me but someone else will step in and do something. Uh, and it creates this um, uh, this impact and this effect that then no one steps in. Uh, and, you know, obviously groupthink, which is, you know, like, um, and that often can happen in organizations um, where things become, things that no, aren't normally normalized become normalized. Uh, and so uh, I, I just am, am really aware of, of those things and how do we combat that? Is there a way to do that legislatively? Uh, and uh, I haven't gotten an answer yet, um, but know that there are so many of us who are working on this and um, want to be able to, from the positions that we have and the tools that we have in our tool belt right now, um, want to be able to do something legislatively so that um, you know, in Michigan, we're not reading about, you know, another uh, senseless death. Um, and I am grateful to partners like Jeff uh, in the Senate, um, who have been championing this, you know, for years and years. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we'll pass it over to him, but also happy to answer any questions. And Annie, I think you put um, the 
press conference in the chat. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you, Representative Brabeck. I was uh, incredibly proud to stand with you, and, and I know that Senator Schink was as well uh, from our Washtenaw delegation to uh, stand with the Michigan Legislative Black Caucus during their press conference this week. And Commissioner Somerville just posted the link in the chat, and I, I think it is a um, uh, it was, I thought it was a powerful press conference, and I think you're right that the words of Representative Young and Senator Anthony and Representative McKinney uh, were, were very powerful, and you should check them out. Um, and so in the legislature, uh, you know, we're going to be following the lead of the Michigan Legislative Black Caucus on this issue. And, um, you know, I, I, I guess for my part, I just want to say that uh, I was, of course, disgusted and angry at the, the video and yet another, um, you know, horrific video of a, of a tragic killing. And it just reminded me of you know, the uh, anniversary coming up of George Floyd's murder and how in the Michigan legislature, despite, you know, those those instances and those powerful videos, uh, we've done nothing to improve police accountability, to uh, reform police operations, uh, or to uh, really give additional tools to law enforcement leaders who want to crack down on bad behavior or, or, or to do anything to affect police culture in the legislature in the last four years of Republican control. And, and I know that if we were to put some good legislation on the governor's desk, uh, she would sign it. And, and so it was very disappointing that even ideas like training, which seem like simple, obvious ideas that are broadly supported, we couldn't even get those things done in the last majority. But it's a new year, it's a new day. Uh, thanks to a lot of the work that people on this call have put in. Uh, we have a Democratic majority, and even though it's a slim one, I feel very hopeful that we can do some things in Lansing uh, to improve policing in Michigan. And, um, you know, look, at first, I just want to say briefly that uh, I, I, I acknowledge, I think all of us acknowledge that, you know, there's only so much we can do from Lansing to affect police culture. We need strong law enforcement leaders. Uh, and so, you know, people like uh, Sheriff Clayton, one of the things we can do, though, in addition to electing and supporting law enforcement leaders who believe in reform, people like Prosecutor Savitt, we can also uh, do things in Lansing to support them uh, with laws and funding. And so, you know, I think that we're going to be doing that. Uh, and Representative Brabeck mentioned a lot of the things that, that we're talking about on that list. Uh, and I just want to stop to say that... Uh, Training is gonna be, I think, an important part of that because we're talking about moving the culture. And one of the things we don't have in Michigan is requirements for continuing training. So not only do we need to improve the academy and reduce some of that cowboy culture and bring in more of a cooperative culture, uh, we need to keep doing that every year, even with officers who maybe went through the, you know, were cadets five years ago or 10 years ago. And we also know and expect that training will continue to improve. And us legislators need to get more active in looking at exactly what kind of training is deployed, what kind of training is the, are the taxpayers funding, and how can we not just add things like call competency and implicit bias and violence de-escalation, but take out some of that cowboy culture stuff that they're teaching right now in the in the in the cadet school a couple of the things that i think we want to add to that list are uh, requiring in independent investigations of police misconduct even when we have uh, a, 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 you know, a local internal affairs organization within a sheriff's department or a good prosecutor. Uh, even in that case, we know that the police and the prosecutor, they're on the same team. We need to have an independent investigations in these serious cases of police abuse to make sure that the public knows that uh, uh, that's being handled in an independent way. We need to empower the police licensing and certification bodies to take licenses away from bad officers. Uh, right now, the law is that officers basically have to commit a felony or a very serious misdemeanor to lose their license. And uh, I just think that we need to give the licensing bodies a little bit more authority to make sure that when we put somebody out there and we give them the power that a police officer has and we put a badge and a gun in their hand, that there is more accountability and more of an opportunity uh, to remove that license when they do really bad things. Because what I believe is that if we're going to affect the culture, the biggest thing we can do in Lansing to affect the culture is to have accountability. And I think that's one of the things I hear from residents most often, uh, residents who are frustrated and angry about police, residents who support the police on all sides. Everybody is saying we can't have good culture if there's no accountability. And so I, I think that's one of the things I'm going to be focused on. I'd be really happy to work with folks like Representative Brabeck and the Michigan Legislative Black Caucus to try to inject more accountability into that process. And, and then finally, I just wanted to say, because um, 
you know, these meetings only come along every once in a while on some other topics. Um, I, I just want to let you know that you've got a new Democratic majority in Lansing, first time in 40 years, and we're already moving exciting legislation. We've already passed legislation that is the biggest tax cut for low-income workers in Michigan history, the biggest tax cut for seniors that I, I, I think in Michigan history, certainly in my lifetime. Uh, you know, we're already having hearings on a bill to provide real protections for LGBTQ people in Michigan, something that's been left out for decades and that Republicans wouldn't even let us talk about. We're getting ready to repeal that horrible 1931 abortion law. We're getting ready to move on some important labor protections. So I just wanna let you know that's not the focus today, but there is real action taking place already on those important priorities. Uh, we've already gotten a couple hundred million dollars uh, to support our effort on affordable housing. And so we're gonna go back to work on those issues and I just want you to know, as the Washington Democrats, your delegation is um, taking this issue of police accountability and doing everything we can to change police culture uh, very seriously. And I'm hopeful that uh, even though we didn't do anything uh, in the wake of George Floyd's uh, death, that by the anniversary of his death uh, this year in May, hopefully we're going to have uh, either bills on the governor's desk or bills that are moving through the legislature that Democrats can be proud of and that people can stand up and say they're doing something about the police brutality. I have a couple of questions and a comment, one that we're, we're going to be spending more time at the beginning of every monthly meeting with you guys, with the, our legislators, so we can find out more about what you're doing, ask more questions, have real conversations with you about um, our priorities, your priorities, all the work that you're doing, because we know you do so much. Um, so we're eager to talk more with you. Um, also, um, I put in the chat, but I'll just speak it. Um, what, what about the power of police unions? How do we deal with police unions? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> you know, we, we deal with them like we deal with any group of organized workers. We sit down, we talk to them, we share with them what we want to accomplish on behalf of the community. We ask them what, you know, their concerns and struggles are, and we try to engage them as partners in changing that culture and providing that accountability. I suspect that there are going to be some issues, particularly when we start talking about accountability that, that they're concerned about and maybe even will oppose. Uh, there may be at the end of the day some disagreements about where we come down on those issues between where at least I'll speak for myself where I land and where they land. But, um, you know, that's how I'm going to approach it. I, you know, I think they're a stakeholder in the process. They're not uh, they're not as important a stakeholder as the community and the public, but, you know, their concerns have to be listened to. And I think that, you know, when officers raise concerns about how, you know, they want to have protections in their jobs and job security, and they want, you know, being a police officer to be a decent job, I, I think that that's an important issue to deal with if we want to improve the culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with what Jeff just said. Um, you know, in terms of trying to understand what are any, you know, what roadblocks they see, you know, um, to being able to uh, just be better. Uh, I also know that in the last package, uh, Senator Olye, uh, he also offered a bill uh, that would allow police unions to refuse representation to a member uh, who has either presses a meritless grievance or uh, is there's some designation or excuse me, some meddling with body cameras. So I know that was one of the bills that also uh, was part of this, but you know, I think that it can be uh, a both and as we're continuing uh, to work on this just unfortunately prevalent uh, and very challenging issue. So you see some you see some opportunity for real collaboration there with mm -hmm. the unions. That's great to hear. Another question, one of our one of our members, Alicia Dyer, is um a very and you too, Felicia, actually a number of people, probably all in the meeting, um, are expert in a trauma in among law enforcement officers, yeah. um, both from the work in law enforcement and and also many are veterans. And um, there's a lot of untreated trauma in among law enforcement officers. So I wonder about a, a, a plans for addressing that. Because then it gets reenacted, you know, the trauma, un, unprocessed trauma, we all know, you know, ends up hurting others. So what are, what are your thoughts about that? Jeff, do you want to start with your what your bills were last time? Sure. 
Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, this is a huge issue. And I think that if anybody has you know, watched these horrific videos, one of the things that, that uh, comes out to me, at least, is, uh, you know, particularly if you look in the eye of Derek Chauvin when he was uh, uh, engaged in the murder of George Floyd, there seems to be a, a, an almost... Um, a vacancy there that I think is indicative of uh, some sort of um, lack of compassion, some sort of like flipping of a switch that, that, that is clear. Anyway, it's clear to me that uh, part of the problem here isn't just making sure that officers are more understanding of dealing with subjects who have mental health concerns or maybe in mental health crisis, but how they themselves have mental health concerns are in mental health crisis. So we built that into the legislation and part of the idea around training specifically. And part of the idea was to make sure that at the earliest point in cadet school and then every year when they have to come back for continuing education, that one of the things that we try to drill into their heads is that you know you are yourself gonna need some mental health support. You're gonna see a lot of trauma. You're gonna deal with people on the worst day of their lives every day. And so, um, you know, destigmatizing that you know, police seeking that kind of help and counseling could be something important and positive that we could do. And, uh, you know, I think that's one of those areas where there, there, there is some agreement with, with uh, some of the folks that are involved in, 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 the, in the process of the career of policing. Uh, so, so that's something that we built into the training legislation, both from a standpoint of trying to make sure they understand and deal better with subjects, but also so that we can maybe break down some of that stigma that's so powerful across society, but that I think is extra powerful within the force around people seeking help themselves because they, they need that kind of help. Great. And as a provider, uh, I agree with, with what Jeff was just saying. I think one of the biggest hurdles, uh, again, is the kind of the group think mentality uh, and the the stigma around what it means, particularly uh, in an organization like police, um, to be able to seek help. You know, it can be seen as a weakness, uh, and when it certainly is not, uh, and it's in fact the opposite. Uh, and uh, I, I just. I can't stress enough, again, I touched on it briefly, but the secondary trauma that, that continues to just perpetuate um, things and is, it can be a spiral uh, mm -hmm. for our officers. Uh, and, you know, certainly that trauma, um, whether they've witnessed or perpetrated it, is carried on into the next incident. And if there's no, um, if there's no intervention um, then they, they just keep building on one another. Uh, and, you know, at some point, uh, something external is going to happen because folks can only withstand so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I, it, you know, obviously, you know, I mean, I say this all the time, but I, you know, I think the world would be a better place if everyone went to therapy. Um, I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and yeah. yeah. Uh, and so certainly thinking about um, our officers who, you know, face danger and their families, right? Like every day as they go uh, to their shifts, face danger and don't know what's going to happen. That alone is a lot to bear. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, and so in being able to process, uh, and kind of reorient in their brains, the, the impact and the, the, the emotional, I mean, now I'm getting into kind of more technical things with their brains, right? The emotional centers that get triggered when these things happen, uh, the better, I think when there's the next incident that then they may be more able to deescalate rather than engage in harmful behavior. And so I, I can't overstate enough how important, uh, being able to use that particular tool, the tool of, of therapy, uh, is in being able to, to uh, engage in these very stressful, uh, very intense interactions that, that do come up. Yeah. It's interesting to me, you mentioned their families just now yeah. and, and right. I mean, I mean, it's incredibly stressful for the yeah. families, the, the yeah. spouses, the children, yeah. the parents. Yeah. Oh, terrifying every single day. And so as you're talking, I'm thinking maybe we have an opportunity to, um, you know, to really bridge the, you know, the gaps that are so, are chasms really between. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah that's right. Interesting. Great. Are there, are there other questions in chat? And I'll jump off because I'm like 
talking too much. What do you got, Florida? There are other questions in the chat, Teresa. And remember, only the panelists can see the chat, so you no, keep on reading. Um, no, I, oh, yeah, people, all of you hosts and panelists, no, when, you, when you put something in chat, click on everyone, not just hosts and panelists, okay? Go one down and click on that. That's true. Um, Kathy mentions that the uh, WCSO has brought the ABLE program to Washtenaw County. Um, it deals with intervention and the mental health aspect. Kathy, do you want to speak to that? And Caroline says, someone suggested to me the police and their unions should be required to purchase malpractice insurance, just like medical providers. That's really interesting. I never heard that. Um, which could conceivably help regulate behavior and relieve taxpayers from the burden of paying for police uh, police-related lawsuits from victims. This, this suggestion was from a current police officer. Caroline, you want to jump on? And I mean, you're you're a panelist. You want to speak to that? And do we have do we have um, uh, Debbie Dingle, Representative Dingle? No, I don't see Debbie. Okay. Yeah, I don't okay. see, yeah, I'm gonna reach out. Uh, good morning, everybody. I was having a conversation with uh, a colleague of a friend of mine um, and a colleague who is a current police officer and has 25 years on the job. Um, and his suggestion was that, you know, we're not looking at the never mind the emotional um, trauma, but the financial trauma that um, misbehavior on people on the part of the police officers costs um, the country, the taxpayers. Um, and he just suggested that if, if police were required to have malpractice insurance, which in and of itself regulates their behavior, right? So if they, the, the more complaints, the more lawsuits they have, that cost is gonna go up um, to the point that they may not be able to, if, if it's linked to their employment, you, you can't work as an officer if you don't have that insurance premium paid on an annual basis, just like police have to qualify for, um, for the gun range every year to show that they're still proficient. Um, this type of life, this type of insurance policy can, can shield the taxpayers, put the burden on the officer and or their unions and it may also help their unions come to some conclusion about, you know, this idea that everyone should be represented regardless of, of what their malfeasance is in the situation. So I had never thought about that. I just thought I would share it with you all broadly because I think it's an excellent idea to look at. Yeah. What do you guys think? That's fascinating. I never heard it either. Yeah, it's a great concept. It's been kicked around. Uh, it's been something that's been discussed in at least the last couple of rounds of discussion that I've been involved in, in terms of like, what should we include in these packages of legislation? I think the reason why you haven't seen it uh, literally proposed in a piece of legislation in Michigan is because uh, uh, some of us who think it's a good concept are trying to, trying to run to ground, trying to play out all the practical details. Um, you know, I think that um, we need to, the question, sort of questions I've been trying to answer to get to whether or not it's something that makes sense to introduce are, you know, is this sort of product out there anywhere? Has anyone else done this before? How much might this insurance cost? Because I, I think that if we were to require that, uh, I think the natural the natural first thought is that like, well, the officer themselves is going to buy that insurance and whether or not they actually buy it or not. Uh, their salary is going to have to reflect that cost at the end of the day. And so, um, you know, how does that get priced in? And um, is that, you know, really shifting the burden to the officer and not the municipality if they're buying that insurance? And, and how exactly would it work? How individualized would it be? So anyway, it's an interesting concept. I think it's fascinating. A lot of folks have suggested it, um, but I've never seen it work out. And I don't, I don't, I don't have my head around the practical details. Jeff, if I can just add, and then I'll, I'll stop talking. Police officers are required to pay for the cost of their uniforms and the equipment. So I don't see how this would be too much different. Um, you know, that's not something, you know, why, if, you, if you're doing a job, why should you have to pay for your uniform that is required in order to do the job? Why should you have to pay for, 
you know, your baton and things like that. So I just think it's something that should be revisited if possible. And thanks for your response to my response. Yes. And you yeah, know, we're, Jeff, definitely, we're definitely, visiting. I think that the uniforms and things like that actually are usually covered in the contract. And I guess I, what I'm saying is that, yeah, no matter how we structure it, and you're right, we could structure it that way. But if like currently a starting officer in department X is making, you know, $41,000 a year. And then all of a sudden we change it so that they're making $41,000 a year minus their $3,000 a year insurance policy. Well, all of a sudden, um, you know, I think that salary probably has to go up to 44 or else nobody's going to take that job uh, is I think the, that's what I mean by the practical aspects of it. Like how would it actually look from an individual standpoint and, 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 and what it, you know, would people do that? You know, I know that when teachers had their health care pop up by a huge chunk back in 2011, uh, you know, that knocked a lot of people out of the profession. That's been one of the things that has contributed to our teacher shortage. And so, um, you know, I, I, I don't, anyway, I want, I want to understand those, 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 that's what I mean by understanding the, getting my heads around the practical aspects before moving forward. Uh, Judge Slay? Uh, thank you. And I want to say thanks um, to Senator Irwin and Representative Brayback. You guys have been doing great work for years. So um, thank you. Um, but I, you know, if there's a, uh, and I can't speak for the whole bench, but I will say that uh, we have to acknowledge too, that when things happen in our community, that there's ripple effects in other avenues where we're providing government service. Um, I mentioned in a comment to Representative Brayback, I can't watch videos. Um, I can't watch the murders. Um, we have enough of them going on in our own communities every day. Um, and part of me thinks that when um, the media is playing them over and over again, and they become so sensationalized, it slightly desensitizes people to it a little bit for some, and it traumatizes others even more. Um, it's kind of like the road to St. Augustine, the road to freedom, right? Littered but with people who had been lynched as a reminder to keep black folks in their place and to break our spirits. Um, and for those who are allies, something to consider that when we're having these types of violence and we're losing um, our young people at an alarming rate in our community, and we're seeing those things play out in the courts as well. Um, one thing that I would love to see consideration for, or at least discussion going forward is for the people who are um, called to our service as jurors. Um, I was campaigning in this last year, I knocked on the lady's door and I unfortunately I didn't recognize her. And she said, do you remember who I am? I said, no, I'm so sorry. Have we met? And she said, I've been in therapy for three years because of you. And I said, oh, whoa, like what's going on? And she said, you told me that there was going to be a really bad trial and we were going to look at really gruesome stuff. And I thought, you know, I watch HBO, I can handle it. And, um, that she sat through to a jury verdict. And I've been hearing that time and time again. Um, and I listen to the warnings that we give our, you know, community members who are coming in for service. It is a ripple effect. And they bring that home to their families and to their kids. And that goes into our schools. Um, and I would love to see, and there's some other counties who are doing this, um, have, and uh, maybe commissioners too, if you are at all interested, I can get some intel for you, where they are um, providing a couple of free therapy sessions for people after they serve jury service. Um, just, you know, we're dealing with all of this at home too. It's, um, it's this is not just a, a national public health crisis, but it's really resonating right here in Washington too. Yeah. It's every, I mean, it happens to everybody in different at different uh, levels. Um, I want to just ask about, I, I want to put out a question. I know, Loretta, we have one minute, but in yeah. chat, there was a really interesting question. Um, uh, somebody wanted panelists to speak to the fact that Tyree's murderers were all Black, five Black men who murdered Tyree and with I, apparently some white cheerleaders or something. I think it's a little bit unclear on that. But all five men were immediately um, fired and charged, unlike in, as we know, when the assailants are white. So does somebody want to speak to that? And then, but just, we only have a minute, so I'm sorry. So it's interesting, you know, that we're talking about this. This is something that we we're also talking about, um, you know, with the MLBC and, uh, the 
the very complicated feelings that we have about that. Uh, and, you know, the wish has been, well, I don't know if wish is the correct word, but, um, you know, being able to see folks who perpetrate this violence be held accountable uh, is something that, you know, so many of us have been trying to push for, uh, for so long. And so, you know, of course, the question it, I think is asked, like, was this, you know, was the execution of this justice um, in this manner um, so swift because they were black as well, right? You know, and it's, I feel like it's a, yeah, it just feels really complicated. It feels very um, layered in terms of uh, why and our, you know, our social contract, construct and context. Um, you know, I certainly am, you know, not part of that and don't know how that police department has um, has acted in the past. You know, I don't know if that's congruent with what they have, you know, how they have handled things, um, you know, in terms of their chief, you know, this may be the way that, that, that she engages uh, in this. I, I don't know that history, um, but certainly it was interesting when, when we were all talking last Saturday, um, that, I mean, one of the things that, you know, uh, Judge Slay mentioned that, you know, she, she texted me about, you know, watching the video after I said that I, I just can't watch it. Um, it. One of the things that we were talking about last weekend with the MLBC was everything being so overwhelming and trying to also wrap our brain around this part, our brains, our collective brains around this part also felt overwhelming mm -hmm. uh, and trying to understand the why around it and uh, the motivation for that. Uh, you know, again, feels very complex and layered. Uh, and so I, I don't know that I have a direct response. I just know that it is something that, um, you know, with legislators we've acknowledged. Uh, and I, you know, again, I don't know the history of that department, but it's, um, it is, it just feels very, it all feels very overwhelming. Thank you. Loretta? Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, thank you everyone for um, for your comments and your um, sharing thus far, and also too for the background help. If you guys, um, you know, saw me, I'm sort of trying to help in the background as well. Um, so now we want to start the program portion of our program where we have um, our guests and. What I mentioned uh, to a couple of people is that if, even though we have the agenda here and I can put it up again if you wanna see it, um, we, uh, if a guest is not here, then we're going to move on to the next guest and just keep things moving. Um, I was just sending a message out to Ms. Michelle about, um, about Speaker Joe Tate. And I don't see him on the list yet. I don't see him here. Um, Michelle, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> he says Michelle. <laughs> it says Michelle, but I, I'm 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 here. <laughs> it's awesome. one of my team members. <laughs> awesome, welcome. Well, okay. Before you start, let me just um mention these things, okay? So I, I wanna say this about uh, Speaker Tate. I did a little bit of research. My first time meeting you, I'm honored. Uh, you grew up on the east side of Detroit, is that correct? Went to MSU. Born. Yes. United States Marine Corps, U of M MBA, and now Speaker. I mean, it, that's a short version. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> So, okay, well, I give you guys Speaker Joe Tate. Welcome. Well, thank you. And uh, I will be brief in my, in my, uh, my comments uh, this morning. Um, first off, I, I want to um, uh, thank uh, uh, my colleagues, I know that are on the call uh, as well too. Um, and all of the work that, that we're doing, I know that they have been uh, keeping you updated in terms of uh, what's been going on in the legislature and that we've been hitting the ground running. 
and um, because that's what um, we were asked to do. Uh, that's why um, that's what the voter the voters did to exercise their power to put us in this position is to move fast. So um, because we do have a lot of work uh, to do. And uh, just want to, to thank you all, uh, Washtenaw County, and the work that you all have been doing um, you know, to get us to this position, because we wouldn't be in this position if it weren't for you, if it wasn't for your time and treasure uh, to allow us to have this, this trifecta. Um, I, you know, I'm excited in terms of, of where we're at um, as a legislature. Um, if you all, uh, many of you all saw the, the, um, the state of the state, and this is something that the governor mentioned. Uh, when you look at the, the faces and the people um, on the rostrum behind the governor, uh, it's totally changed. You know, we have not only myself, uh, a black Detroiter, uh, Speaker of the House. Uh, we have a Senate Majority Leader uh, who is a woman from the Grand Rapids area. Uh, we also have, you know, our phenomenal Lieutenant Governor uh, as as well too. And I think that matters. Um, I think we all know on on this call that that matters. That diversity matters. That how we bring our experiences, our, what our experiences, what our backgrounds it shapes the way that policy is developed and it shapes the way um, in terms of what we want to get across the finish line. As House Democrats, you know, our focus is not only to govern and hit the ground running, um, which I know that it's been discussed there um, by your representatives in the county, um, but also how are we putting people first at the end of the day? How are we focused on supporting working families, uh, ensuring that we do have a world-class education system, how are we valuing our workers, um, and how are we investing in our future, and also how we are ensuring that everyone is treated equally before the eyes of the government. And we've seen that with the first bills that we've been introducing, and we want to continue that. We want to continue that pace to ensure that you know, the work that we're doing is reflected in the values we have in terms of putting people first. In terms of Black History Month uh, as well, which is, you know, is woven into the fabric of this state, I, I just want to touch on um, uh, earlier this, this year during uh, MLK Day, I had the opportunity to uh, hear from uh, Fred Gray who has been a civil rights activist uh, since the 1950s. He's 92 now. Uh, last year, he's still very active. He is uh, received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Biden last year. But he served as uh, attorneys for uh, you know, Mother Rosa Parks, as well as Martin Luther King and other, other leaders. He was, in fact, you know, advising and working with Mother Parks um, a year before um, the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, before they were positioned to um, move into the boycott and before she you know, decided not to, to, to give up her seat. Um, and so he was involved in that. And it was just phenomenal uh, seeing and listening to him in terms of all of the work that took place to get us in this position. Um, and it shows that you know, democracy is a practice across generations. Um, the work that was done, the sacrifice up, up to that point in, in the 1950s and even beforehand, dealing with you know, not only uh, segregation and Jim Crow, but all other uh, impacts that, that, that racism had um, on Black people and Americans in general. Um, now that we are in 2023, I know we were talking about uh, uh, Tyree Nichols, uh, we're also talking about uh, huge inequities that take place. What we have to do, and, and just listening to him, is 
understand that there's always going to be work that's that's going to have have to be done. We have to continue to move the needle, and it requires you know our our head, our heart, and our body at the at the end of the day. You know how are we planning this out? You know how are we executing? And also the emotion that comes with it, um, because you know just announcing you know righting those wrongs that have taken place um, over over decades, over centuries uh, of, of this, this country. So you know, I'm excited about the work that we're going to do. Um, I'm excited to be in this position, um, but also just like many of my colleagues, I am um, understand, understand the responsibility uh, that comes with this. And this is the, the last story that I'll tell um, before uh, I turn it over to the next panelist is my and my colleagues have heard this, you know, my grandmother is she's 100 years old. She actually lives in Memphis now. So I was talking to my family with other family members. So we were talking about um, what happened uh, to Tyree earlier this week um, or past couple of weeks. So she's 100 years old. And she has seen, in just having conversations with her, has seen the good and bad of, of government and how, uh, what government has done. Again, going through segregation, uh, going through uh, Jim Crow, uh, knowing people that, that have been lynched uh, in the South. She came up from Alabama and knowing, you know, family members that had to leave town because, you know, uh, a white person felt that, you know, they were slighted uh, by one of their family members. So she's seen the worst, um, but she's also seen the best. And she's talked to me about seeing the best as well, too. You know, when you talk about the Voting Rights Act, you talk about um, civil rights, you talk about Medicare, Medicaid, um, you, you talk about all of these things. Um, with in terms of seeing the good and the bad um, that government does um, and how it plays a role in terms of in terms of how we treat one another. Um, and my thought is like, how do we do the best of government? Not always the perfect of government because we know that this is a human organization. We're, no, we're not always going to get the perfect right, but how do we get to the best of government in terms of the work that we're, we're doing? So I'm excited to be on this journey um, with you all, you know, in terms of what we're doing in Michigan. Um, we're gonna keep pushing. I mean, that's going to be our job. Uh, we were given um, you know, our marching orders. As Democrats, we've been talking about what we need to do um, in terms of making this state better. So uh, now it's time to execute because there's certainly no secrets or surprises there. So looking forward to the conversation and thank you for allowing me to speak. Speaker Tate, thank you so much. Listen, I'm gonna turn this over to Teresa in one second, but I'd like to ask you this question first. And that is, um, some people may not know what the role of speaker is. Can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. So, so the Speaker of the House, um, per the Constitution, is the, the presiding officer of the chamber. Uh, so in terms of, you know, view it as, as if you look at it, you know, um, on the private sector side, kind of the, the CEO of, of the chamber. Um, with all of our members being independently elected, um, as well, so everyone obviously does have a voice, but the speaker kind of um, manages uh, the operations of the house. So, in terms of committee assignments, uh, in terms of you know what what legislation gets to to go up on the board, uh, as well as as staffing um, at, there. So, essentially, the speaker serves as as a presiding officer and and that responsibility of making the house operational is, is, is the speaker's role. Uh, there are other duties that, that in terms of appointments that 
uh, the speaker does have as well too. Um, but that's primarily uh, the role of the speaker is just ensuring that the house is in operation and that it's actually doing the work that it needs to, to do in terms of getting legislation um, outside of the, out of the chamber. Speaker Tate, I'm, I'm, Loretta turned it over to me just because we need to tag team from now and then. Um, it's so great to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. We're just thrilled to have you as Speaker of the House. It is really exciting. Um, I do have one question in chat and that, I, I, well, have more, I've, I have my own, but one is uh, what kind of responses are you getting from Republicans behind the public statements? Are there any, uh, is there any openness to collaboration? And specific initiatives? I, I think there are opportunities um, in terms of working in a bipartisan fashion. Um, there certainly will be. I think for, for us, now that we are in charge and we're leaving, uh, we'll have to get them there um, in terms of the work uh, that we're doing. You know, next week uh, we're, we're going to be doing, um, we're pulling together a tax relief package. Um, that is long overdue, frankly. And, you know, in terms of um, what that looks like, I think there are opportunities for bipartisanship. I think most of the work that we do end up doing uh, will be in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, there'll probably be less than a handful of things that will be um, partisan in nature and in my mind. But um, it's important for us, I think, to show, you know, as, as we do move um, in the united front, I think that actually, in fact, helps with the bipartisanship because there are some on the other side of the aisle that, that don't want to see us succeed mm -hmm. just because they, you know, they're, they're just going to be, um, you know, full on. Uh, political and you know at the end of the day they want to be um, in charge and everything else be damned at the end of the day. But I think you know with the work that that we do in terms of um, holding to our values and being able to get that legislation up where where it forces them to make a decision, um, I think a decision that's a, that that they know will help their constituents. I think they'll be coming on board um, in a bipartisan fashion. Yeah, because it can be used against them later. Um, other questions in chat. Um, I, I have a question um, about, I've heard from a number of people's anxiety about um, the impact of the backlog of ambitions that we have as Democrats after having been shut out of power for so long. And people are like, oh, you know, people are afraid we're going to fumble the ball because we're going to try to get too much done or, you know, and so hearing you, I, my anxiety is relieved, but, um, but I wonder if you, and also of course, Senator Briggs, but we want to speak to that for just a minute about strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Our first, our first seven bills, uh, technically seven bills um, are kind of a reflection of, of the direction that we want to go. And I think, they're really, they're really two parts of this, but they overlap. Um, the first part is, you know, showing to your point that we can govern. Um, I think there are a lot of things that we have to do. I mean, obviously the budget has to be done. We want to make sure that we're delivering a budget um, before we go, before we get to the summer, because we know locals and school districts, like they need to plan. Uh, so we have to do our job there, but also the re reflecting our values. So our our six areas that that we worked with our Senate Democrat counterparts with in the House on the um, House side, we we introduce earned income tax credit, a working families tax credit, looking to uh, repeal the the pension tax. Um, also looking at, which I believe Senator Irwin brought this up, Elliot Larson, expanding Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act to include the LGBTQ community. Um, 
also the 1931 abortion ban. And then you also see prevailing wage and repealing right to work. So I think we uh, made that signal in terms of here are the issues that, that we've been hearing that have been bubbling up. It's not the entire list, as you mentioned, because there is a lot of pent up demand. There's a lot that we need to do, but being able to focus on those big ticket items out of the gate, not, not saying that we won't be focusing on other issues because obviously, you know, the conversation I know with Representative Brayback um, and Senator Irwin around police accountability is incredibly important. Uh, incredibly, incredibly important to our caucus and to our members. Uh, gun violence reduction, which I know Representative Brayback is working on as, as well too. Uh, those are going to be in the mix, but in terms of what we're trying to, to move and telegraph is, you know, we want to be able to, um, or we showed that with the first bills that we've been introducing, um, and then being able to work through those other um, those those other issues and policy prescriptions that that we need to get done, and and you're absolutely right. It's we only have so much time, uh, and that's why we kind of hit we hit the ground running uh, this month. The governor signed uh, uh, PA one, her first public act, um, the first month of this legislative session. This is that's the first time a public act has been brought to a governor's desk and signed um, since in the first month of a legislative session since 1947. Uh, so we know that, you know, again, there's a lot of pent up demand. So we got to make sure that we're moving and we're not going to get things perfect all the time. We might have to come back and clean some things up. Uh, but I think it's incredibly important for us to show that we're moving the ball forward, that we're trying to put people first. We're trying to get legislation across the finish line as, as quickly as we can, but as and balanced and as thoughtfully as we can as well, too. If we make some mistakes, we'll come back and, and, and take care of that um, as well. It's incredibly impressive. We're so we're so thankful that you're there. Loretta, I'm going to send it back to you because you're you're in charge. OK, sounds good. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you, Speaker Tate. Speaker Tate, we appreciate your time here. And this has been recorded. I'm not sure if you know that, but it has been recorded and it will be uploaded to our website once this is done. Were there any other questions for the speaker? Oh, there was a question. Let me see. Have you been told that you look like Shaq? <laughs> That's a good one. I haven't. I haven't. I've been told I look like Tyler Perry recently. Oh, Tyler too. I uh, uh <laughs> I'm not as creative though. So I, I uh, <laughs> lean on my colleagues to help with my creativity. Okay. <laughs> Well, we thank you for being here. We appreciate your time. And please allow us to invite you again and hopefully you'll put us in your schedule. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, um, so now our next um, guest actually is supposed to be Mayor Nicole Brown, but I don't see her on our list. I don't see her here. So we're going to turn this over to uh, Sheriff Jerry Clayton. Sheriff Clayton, are you ready? I am. Um, see if I can get off camera. I saw it at one point. Okay, well, while you do that, let me just do a, look, a small introduction okay. of you. Okay, so Sheriff Clayton was elected for four terms. Um, he is a graduate of EMU, Go Hurons or Eagles, whichever one you might have been. <laughs> Uh, in public safety. He is nationally and internationally known in the criminal justice field, mental health and mentoring. And I give you guys our own Sheriff Jerry Clayton. Take it away. Well, thank you very much. Good morning. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, my video is a little bit off because um, I'm actually in D.C. getting ready to do a presentation to uh, our nation's sheriffs, which who can be a challenging bunch, but it's really about the investment 
we've made in what we call um, DDAR, so deflection, diversion, alternatives, and reentry, um, and how much we invest our budget in that space, trying to convince them that that is the way to go. If we're really going to be tough on crime, is to be tough on the things that we know contribute to crime, not to people. So, um, really happy to be here. I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, uh, it was great following uh, Speaker Tate an impressive uh, gentleman. We're so happy that uh, he's in leadership. So I'm going to jump right to it. I know I have 10 minutes to sort of frame some stuff. So I'll start with um, my reflection comes from a, there was a, a conversation on ESPN as we talk about being first, right? Being first and being many. Uh, a couple of days ago where you had three people, uh, three African-American men, Stephen A. Smith, um, a coach, Herm Edwards, who was a coach and a player, and another gentleman who just retired. And both both the coach, Coach Herm Edwards, who's been around since 1979 in NFL, talked about how discouraged he was uh, that we were talking about at the time that there were two African-American quarterbacks starting in the Super Bowl for the first time. Not the fact that there were two, the fact that we still have to talk about it, that it's so rare, that it never happens, that we have to talk about it. Then the other gentleman, other NFL player, I can't remember his name, um, um, said the same thing, uh, that, that he was a little discouraged, the fact that we have to keep talking about um, all these things, and this should be um, a consistent thing that, occur, that occurs, that it should occur so often that we don't even have to mention it. And then Stephen A. Smith said, um, you know what, I, I respectfully disagree. Uh, yeah, the fact that we that is so rare that we have to mention it might be an issue, but we should never stop talking about it. We should never stop talking about the fact and acknowledging the people that came first. And he talked about Marlon Briscoe from the Denver Broncos, who's the first black quarterback in 1968. So some of you may say, well, why is he talking about all this? Because really what Stephen A. said resonated with me, that we have to acknowledge not just the first, but all the folks that preceded us. You know, we all stand on the shoulders of the folks that preceded us. And yes, I think uh, there's, there's some value in acknowledging the first, but there's a value in acknowledging everyone that puts one of those bricks along that path that we all have to follow. Whether it's on a national perspective, a local perspective, there are so many that have blazed our trails and we have to honor uh, those sacrifices and courage. So when I saw we were talking about this, we hit some first, some of us that are on the panel, but we also know that there were not just first, but second and thirds before us from the Alma Will, 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 Willis Smiths to the Conan Smiths to all the other folks that come that have come before us. Those are the building blocks. So in my mind, you know, we all have this enormous responsibility to lay a few more solid bricks along that road for the generations that follow us to, to, to travel. Um, um, and I think, you know, as I think about, from my perspective, what it means to sort of be the first in a particular space, I think it requires a number of things. It requires faith and focus, uh, faith in in in, um, in 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 your spiritual leaders, faith faith in God, faith in yourself, and faith in the people that you surround yourself with. Focus. Listen, um, I think Speaker Tate talked about it. We talked about the fact that you know Democrats are running everything in state government. There's a small window to be successful. And folks are worried that, you know, we got to do it now. Or we'll never get another chance. And that might be true. But I think if we do it right the first time, people will see the value of our work and they'll continue to invest their votes in us. So if you're first, I think there's tremendous pressure for you to be for at least I'm talking about for me. It was just tremendous pressure to be focused, to be focused on outcomes, to be able to tell people what you're going to do, then do it and then tell people and then show them that you did it. And not just for you, but for the for, for their value. So we all should exist to serve, and we should exist to serve in a way that is valuable for the people that we're serving, not just for ourselves. So if you're in that group of first or fifths or whatever, I think it also re requires a certain strength and confidence and resilience and a strong sense of values and a strong sense of self-worth. And, and it's my belief that you can't look for others to validate who you are if you're in this space. And I'll speak as an African-American male. Uh, I've never looked for others to value that validate my work. Not before looking inside first, because if you're in a leadership position, you're going to make decisions. You're going to you're going to take actions. And I think Speaker Tate talked about it a couple of times. Government's not perfect because people are perfect. 
And you're going to make the decisions that some might not be the right ones in the eyes of other folks. And you, you can't say I'm going to be perfect or anything, but you have to have faith in what you do and you have to do. And you can't look to others to validate you. The only people I look really to validate me is my wife, my kids, and my family to validate that I'm a good person. And then hopefully, if we're doing the work now in the workspace, say as sheriff, the validation comes because we said we were going to do certain things to change people's experience and we've done it. And people actually come and say, yeah, I, my experience is different because of the leadership and the things that you've done in, in your position. The other thing I think is important too is a willingness to stand up for what you believe in, even in the face of criticism, public or private. Because the people I think in the positions that we hold that don't get criticized are the people in these positions that don't do anything, that don't stand for anything that are so worried about being criticized, they have to put their finger up every now and then to see which way to win the public opinion is going before they make a decision. My belief is when you are first, especially a first, whether it's from a gender standpoint or race and ethnicity, you have to be willing to take stands, value-based, principle-based stands, and then stand behind them. Because that is part of setting those solid foundational bricks. Um, just a couple things. Uh, a couple more things. You know, when I first got elected, I had a mentor tell me a couple of things. And uh, he's a, a friend of mine who was a, uh, down in, 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 in Texas doing some work that was high profile, African-American, young, young, a uh, little bit older than me. And he said, Jerry, I'm just going to tell you, you know, you've been blessed. You, you're in this position. Um, and he said a couple of things to keep in mind is that you you don't have um, you you you. If you don't have the courage to stand up for what you believe in and to advocate certain principles when needed, why are you in a position? And if you only take decisions and you only do things with the with the thought of being reelected the next time, then you're you're in the wrong business. You're not serving not only your constituents that that elected you, you're not serving the people that you represent, both people that look like you and both people that don't look like you. And he also said this to me, he says, you know, and, and I've said this to folks before, that uh, there are two lenses that influence what I do. The fact that I'm as a 58-year-old Black man in this country, I'm sorry, that is my experience. And raising three now African-American young men, everything I do is filtered through that. And the fact that I'm in a profession that has its own 400 years of troubled history. That there's nobility in the profession, and I've said this before. We have, but there's nobility in the intent in the profession. But you have to have more than just intent. We got to put the work in to change all of these things, not just at a local level, but a national level. So he also told me this. He said, "Don't believe the hype and praise that you get in your face, because oftentimes the conversations are different, and the words that are used to describe you are different when you're not in the room." So what you do, you do for purpose and value, and for impact, not for praise. Because that praise can turn into criticism right away. And if you're driven by both of those two things, you're distracted and you can't be affected. And I'll end with this for the people that, that know me. So let me back up. Whether we're talking about the death of Mr. Nichols or the countless other deaths that have happened of African-American folks, all folks from African-American folks, uh, at the hands of police violence, police interaction, um, Being in this profession, being a part of that is a challenge in and of itself. But my belief is we have to stay in and have that fight because you've got to have people sitting at the table making decisions and pushing back against the folks that don't want to do the right thing. So this is the story I'll tell and then I'll, I'll, I'll pause. Um, and some people have heard this before, but I think it's really important to understand where my values come from. I am a child of the South, born in Bessemer, Alabama. Um, raised by great parents, but also raised by great grandparents. And I had a grandfather that did uh, the work that, you know, a carpenter work, get up early in the morning, put his stuff on the truck and then go out there and do the work. As I got older, I'd ask him all these questions. He'd always tell me a couple of them. The one he told me that has always stuck with me is the sundown rule. That he had to get up early. Cause I asked him why he got up so early, four o'clock and was on the road by five. It's cause I gotta get all my work done. Cause I gotta be back on my neighborhood, in my neighborhood, on my block by five, six o'clock before the sun goes down. So he told me that in general for a while, I never understood. And as I got older, I asked him, he said, well, why? I, I finally asked him why. And he said, because if I don't, 
I will end up like my friends and other people that I know, I will disappear and I will be hung. So that stuck with me. And he also talked about, you know, the police were part of that. So let me just fast forward really, really quick to 20 years later. Um, I joined the sheriff's office. I'm in uniform. I go see him now because I live with my parents. And he gave me this look of essentially disgust. And I couldn't understand it. I asked my dad. My dad told me to go back and ask my grandfather. And, you know, the conversation he said, was, you be, how can you join something? You're betraying all the things that I taught you. Because he saw the police as the enemy. And that really impacted me quite a bit. And I'll tell you, I had many, I've had many opportunities to lead a profession. I stayed for one reason. My pledge to him is I'm going to stay in and be in a position where I can make the change that I can make. So I, my career, what we have done is try to do it at the local level, but also at the national level. I don't want to be in D.C. this today. I want to be talking to the National Church Association for the most part with so many people that don't share my values. But I think it's so incredible uh, and, and um, important for them to hear the perspective of those that don't share those same beliefs that they do. That there is a different way to provide the service in a way that honors the sanctity of all human life. That we as Black folks matter, have value, and there is nothing in the profession that calls for the violence and the murder of Black folks. So um, I will continue to try to lead in that way, as imperfect as I am, for my remainder of my time in office. And when I leave office, I will try to do that work in a different way. Hopefully I didn't go too far over, but I'll stop right there. You did just fine. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say we are going to leave questions to the end. So Sheriff, if you could stick around, that would be wonderful. If you have to leave, then we're going to have questions in the chat and we will make sure and get those out to you. Okay, but if you can stick around, great. All right, thank you. Okay, um, <clears throat> I did put a uh, message in the chat for our panelists and our hosts and um, uh, I hope you guys recognize that that was just for you guys, not for anyone else. Anyway, um, let's move on. We've had some wonderful, wonderful people um, we have some wonderful people, and I just want to give a shout out to my colleague and friend, Kathy Wyatt, who actually did all this. She's the one who's uh, gathered all the guests, and she's helped me, in, as well as Eli. And so, um, you know, my job here is just to facilitate, which I'm having so much fun doing and listening. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to bring on our next guest, which is going to be... Um, Commissioner Justin Hodge. Justin, are you ready? Yep. Awesome. Okay, let me say a little bit about, about Justin. Um, <clears throat> make sure I have his information. Where do we have it? Okay, Justin, I know you're here. Okay, here you are. So Justin is serving his second term as county commissioner, uh, delivering on promises he made. He was unanimously elected by his colleague as chair of the county commissioner. By trade, Justin is a professor of social work at University of Michigan. Uh, he prepares students to find policy solutions to address the most pressing problems impacting our, our society. And I give you Commissioner Justin Hodge. Well, thank you for the introduction and thanks for having me. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a good morning and there's a lot to talk about today. Uh, it's always hard to follow Sheriff Clayton. Uh, I want to frame some of my comments around things that we can do more here in Washtenaw County. Um, you know, we finally have control of the legislature like we talked about before, but we've had democratic control uh, across local governments and county government in Washtenaw County for, or for years. And there are still really significant challenges that we're all, um, you know, working to to address, uh, and as Sheriff Clayton mentioned, you know, uh, all of us are coming after many others that have laid uh, the groundwork for us to do the work that we're doing now. Um, so I just want to share a few um, statistics here uh, that would hopefully hopefully alarm people and get you thinking about what can we do here to try to address some of the challenges. So one of them that I always like to point to, um, and and you can look at this too. We have this tool that we use at the county called the Opportunity Index that matches uh, that. Uh, shows you different uh, across different dimensions, opportunity across health, uh, wealth, and a wide variety of things, educational outcomes for people. 
So you can look and see uh, on a color coded map where you can see where there's lower uh, health outcomes and life expectancy where, and where people tend to uh, congregate there making more money and where there are lower income uh, communities. Uh, as I would, that would be surprising, uh, most of that maps right over uh, racial lines largely. Um, so in my district, I represent um, part of the county where we see low, lower opportunity across health and wealth. Um, so one thing I always point out is that uh, a black resident that lives in the Ypsilanti area on average tends to have a seven year lower life expectancy than their neighbors, uh, white neighbors in the Ann Arbor area. Uh, and that really just shouldn't be the case. We have so much um, wealth and resources here in Washington County that we should be able to address disparities like that. Um, and we've done a lot of that work. Uh, we have you know, many former commissioners here that have laid the groundwork um, for us, what us in Washtenaw County having our racial equity office. Um, and that's something I wanna talk about today too. So if anybody follows our board of commissioner meetings closely, you know, we were supposed to have one on Wednesday. Unfortunately, we had to cancel it. Uh, thank you, Teresa, for putting that in the chat. Uh, so in the chat, there's a link to the opportunity index. Uh, we were supposed to have a board of commissioner meeting this Wednesday, but because of the power outage in downtown Ann Arbor, we had to cancel. Um, I was really excited for us to have this meeting because we were going to be doing the final vote on the formation of a reparations advisory council. And the goal of the reparations advisory council uh, will be once we create it, we're going to appoint um, a number of experts across a number of different sectors, ranging from education, labor, wide wide number of um, sectors to advise, to do the work over uh, a number of years and we're looking at it in two year chunks. So the terms will be for two years and then we're gonna get a report from them about what could reparations look like in Washtenaw County. Uh, we, it's not a task force because we don't expect that the work is gonna get done within a defined period of time. So we're expecting to get regular updates from the group once we form it. Um, so we passed the, we, we have to, this is the thing we have to vote on it twice. So we did the first reading of it at our last meeting and then we'll do the final reading of it uh, at our next meeting, which will be in two weeks. Um, we are going to be one of the first uh, county governments uh, and local government, including local governments that um, is really moving forward on this kind of reparations work. Um, there are a few others across the country that are doing that, and we can look to them for guidance on it. But Washtenaw County is really leading in that. Um, so my hope is that once we form this reparations council, uh, we'll be able to, uh, ultimately what they're gonna do is provide us with advice on what the county government can do specifically related to reparations. So it's not going to be, it's not gonna be us telling like Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor's government or Ypsilanti's government what they should do. This is gonna lead to direct uh, recommendations for what we can do uh, as a county government. So with that in mind, um, I'd really like for all of us to, to think about what can we do to um, support the elected officials that we've helped elect across Washtenaw County um, to, to do more of this kind of work and to get other people to think about running. So uh, I'm on the panel and I'm not the first uh, African-American male chair of the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners. Conan Smith is and he's in the uh, in the audience. Good to, good to see your name on there, Conan. Um, but I'm here to really talk about why representation matters and to say something else about our current board. Our current board is majority minority, uh, majority women, and majority millennial, which I think is, uh, is really unique, particularly uh, in this time. Um, so representation really does matter. And for us to to do a lot of the progressive kinds of work that, that we're doing now, that happens because of the different, of the representation that we have on our board of commissioners. Uh, that's not the same kind of representation we see across all of our local governments. I think a lot of the time people aren't really thinking about, um, they're not really thinking about township boards, which we really should. Uh, they're not always thinking about school boards uh, or library boards. Um, so that's something that we really need to, to draw more attention to. Uh, something else that I'll talk about is that we've really leaned into the work around trying to address community violence. And that's something that is new for the county relatively. We did, we started a lot of this work in our last term. Um, and we see that, um, we, we know that there are pockets uh, across the county where we're seeing uh, a lot of uh, violence among small a small group of community members. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it tends to include a lot of kids. Um, the county, and I've been really impressed with and, and grateful to, to my colleagues uh, for working with me on this work. Uh, I think about this a lot because back when we were doing our Board of Commissioner meetings on Zoom, uh, so I live in Sugarbrook and it's one of the neighborhoods where we do see higher levels of community violence. Uh, there was a shooting down the street from my house during one of our Board of Commissioner meetings. So I was sitting right here where I'm at right now in my house doing, doing the Zoom meeting. I had to step away from it uh during the meeting and then come back and i think when that happened uh because deputies came by my house um so i think when that happened it really 
help the others on the board see that this issue that we talk about community violence isn't something that's like way out there. It's something that's you know really impacting our residents uh, and it's, it hits closer to home. So from there, we really worked um, to do more of that work and, and put money behind it. So we did a recent allocation of uh, more than a million dollars to doing to supporting violence interruption work in our community. Um, and we're looking I'm looking forward to us doing more of that. Um, what else would be good to share about this? So I'd say, yeah, encourage more people to look at what's going on locally. Uh, we talk about county government as we're not the kind of government that says you can't do a thing, but we really support others. Uh, whether it's nonprofits and other community groups and other governments in doing things. Uh, we're really very much, we think of ourselves as the safety net for the county uh, and a service provider. So if there are certain issues that you're seeing, uh, county government is usually working to address those issues uh, and is, the, I think, the kind of government that touches uh, your life the most. So I will stop there and look forward to answering questions later. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner Hodge. Um, all right, so our next guest, let me see again, we are missing um, Mayor Brown, but she did mention that she wouldn't be able to be here. So our next guest is going to be the illustrious Judge Arianne Slay. Judge Slay, are you ready? Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe. Hi, I can be ready. I'm ready right now. I'm ready. There you are. There you are. Awesome. Okay. All right. So Judge Slay, now let, correct me if I'm wrong, but you grew up in, in Ann Arbor. Uh, yep. Yeah, for the most part. Yep. Okay. Went to MSU for, at the College of Law, nine years in Washington County Prosecutor's Office, and 13 years in criminal justice system as a trainer, instructor, and presenter. Yes. Okay. And three months as Washington County Circuit Court Judge. I give you Judge Ariane, Ariane Slay. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I feel honored to be here. This is like such a powerhouse group of folks you've asked to be on the panel. And I, um, it's a little intimidating. And I'll um, echo that going after uh, Sheriff Clayton is always rough. So got to remember that. We always got to end with him, uh, end on high note. Um, one of the things that my... Uh, husband and I were talking about recently in regards to um, doing better in the future in terms of equity and representation and how we can continue this trend that we saw locally of um, bringing some new fresh faces into the political realm for representation is that we have to really acknowledge our history. Like we can't escape it. Um, so we have to remember that tomorrow's not written. So kind of the challenge that I think of, and um, I'm very new to political office, so I'm just starting to like um, figure out some of these truths that I'm sure some of our, um, our veteran folks uh, know to be all too well, um, is that there is a responsibility. And Sheriff Clayton talked about how he felt um, and what that means to him going forward. And I have this um, uh, thing hanging in my office that my husband got for me and it said, uh, give thanks and everything. And every day when I walk in, I'm thankful I'm here. I'm thankful I had the opportunity to, to serve um, in this capacity, but I'm incredibly cognizant and aware and it is not lost on me, the responsibility that I have so that we can I mean, if I screw up, then all the naysayers are going to be like, I told you we shouldn't have had a black woman in this job. Um, and I want to not only leave the door open, but to help bring other people who haven't had a face and a space that is safe to be in a position like I have as judge, I need to give them the opportunity. Um, so how does that translate into um, those of you who are listening? What does that mean? What can you do to help if this is something, if representation is also important to you? How can you help? And I get some thought to that. And I think the first is smart recruiting. You not only have to recruit candidates, but you have to recruit a network of supporters because no one candidate can do anything on their own. Um, that has to be very deliberate. It has to be very planned. And you need people who have done it to show you how it gets done. And then you need to support that candidate high and low through the race. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed um, being here just for the last couple of months is that it helps to stay engaged. 
um, not only as a candidate, but for those supporters. Um, I'm grateful for everyone who was supportive during my race. It's it, it's a very isolating and lonely spot once you get into the role as well. Um, having that open line of communication um, when it's appropriate and having that opportunity to um, still hear the community concerns you know, when you're not out seven days a week meeting with people, because um, you can't do that. I mean, the job requires you to be at work seven days a week now. Um, support your local candidates when they're in office. Um, and I think that's something that if, um, if I haven't been doing for all of you who um, help me, I need to do a better job and I hope that you do the same. I'm happy to answer any of the questions that we had at the end too. I appreciate it. Thank you, Judge Flair. Um, okay, let me just check and see if, yes, Mayor Nicole Brown has joined us. I'm so, so pleased. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Mayor Brown, are you ready? Sure. Okay. Well, hang on one second. I'm going to uh, do an introduction of Mayor Nicole Brown. So Mayor Brown grew up in Ypsilanti. She also went to EMU, go Hurons or Eagles. It must be Eagles for you. <laughs> uh, former city councilwoman uh, posted and posted a quote on her, um, on her um, campaign site of one of my favorite people, Byron uh, Stevenson from Equal Justice and the um, Lynching Museum. I give you Mayor Nicole Brown. Take it away. Well, good morning. It's still morning. Um, and I apologize for my tardiness. I actually had to see a client this morning because I'm also a therapist um, and they needed my help. Um, but thank you all so much and thank you for having me. Um, I really do appreciate the invitation and I was listening to what um, the end of what Judge Slay was talking about around representation and the expectation, um, you know, as a black woman in a role. And uh, it really truly resonates with me around um, what I feel like the expectations for me are. And um, as a new mayor and as a young mayor and as a black woman as mayor, um, oh, sorry, I saw something in the chat. Um, so yes, I was raised most of my life in Ypsilanti. I served on city council for the past eight years as the ward one representative and for four of those um, as mayor pro tem. And I'm just honored and humbled to continue the work um, within the Ypsilanti community and to partner with you know, my colleagues and friends uh, to move our community forward. Um, I know I missed the beginning of the meeting, so I wanna make sure what you would like me to be talking about um, in, these, in these few minutes, but... Um, I'm this good. is, I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, <clears throat> Mayor. This actually is uh, 10 minutes of um, talking freely. So you can choose any topic you wanna talk about. Oh, okay, look, 10 minutes talking freely with uh, folks in politics. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you know, some of my goals and commitments are to number one, strengthen um, partnerships across the county and especially Eastern Washington County um, so the, to make sure that, you know, all of us who are representing individuals within Ypsilanti voices are heard um, to increase social and racial equity within our community. Um, I know that you know Sheriff Clayton is on here. Um, we've talked a lot about what it looks like to um, really support and change the way that policing is done in our community. And so that's a big commitment, commitment of mine. Um, one of the, the, the key points and programs that we're trying to work through uh, is an unarmed crisis response team within Ypsilanti. It was something that I talked a lot about during the campaign, you know, as a social worker, as someone who works with those who have been labeled at risk or in need, um, who have mental health challenges. It's really, really important for us to have folks who, um, you know, have the training, have the understanding of how to engage with someone who's in crisis, who's having a mental health crisis, who's in need of resources, um, within our community and not always have our police officers and our armed individuals interfacing with those folks because we know what that looks like when you see someone with a badge or a gun show up to a situation when someone is it might be deteriorating or might need some additional support. 
Um, and so my hope and goal is to be able to partner um, with my colleagues to figure out how we can better manage those situations um, and work within the community. Another is, you know, for um, our economic development within Ypsilanti, as well as our housing development, our housing stock is really, really low and we need additional affordable and attainable spaces for folks to be able to live and thrive. We know that basic needs have to be met for anyone to be able to have a full, um, you know, and successful life. And when you don't have somewhere to live, um, that really impacts everything else that you're able or not able to do within our community. And so as of late, Ypsilanti has, you know, broken ground on some new affordable housing. Um, and our goal is to continue doing that work and hopefully having our neighboring communities also pitch in and, and do that to make sure that folks who wanna live here can be here. Um, we want anyone who wants to live and stay and also come to live in Ypsilanti, work in Ypsilanti, play in Ypsilanti to be able to do so. Um, I think one of the things that I wanted to share when I was thinking about getting on this panel is just my why and why I decided um, to run and what my goal as an individual, my values are around being in elected office. Um, and I decided to run because I started off becoming civically in engaged when I was maybe 15 or 16 years old in Ypsilanti. I was a part of a group um, called Ypsilanti Youth Empowered to Act. And I will say my mom and my dad forced me to join it and to meet new people and to just get acclimated to the community. And I didn't wanna do it. And I'm so glad that I did now because it became, it threaded throughout my life. And um, what I'm most passionate about is working with people and being in community. And we would go and present to city council at the time about what was important for young people, um, safe places, safe spaces, and the needs of youth in our community. And from there, um, I just became engaged with the community and wanting to do more and be a part. And so when I went to Eastern and um, yes, go green, I was, I'm an Eagle. Uh, I worked in you know community development and our diversity and community involvement office and academic service learning and everything that I did from that point forward was threaded in kind of grassroots organizing volunteerism um, and just giving back and working alongside those who who had given so much to me um, and so that you know really is what's rooted me in in this work even when it gets really hard is that I see the value and what it means to to partner and to lift as you climb and to teach and what representation looks like. You know, I saw Trudy Swanson, I saw Lois Richardson on city council back then. Um, I saw others who were engaging heavily in the community when I was a teenager. Um, and from there, I wanted to also be able to do that for other young women, young black women and just young people in general. Um, this past week, actually, I, I spent time with two different sets of young people um, from our community reads as well as Ozone House and it just re-energized me to see how excited they were to see someone who looked like them in, in this position. They were like so shocked to hear that I was the mayor. And once they found out, they were so excited and had so many questions and talked about what their talents were and what their hopes, dreams, and wishes were. And for me, that is what fuels me to continue doing this work and to make sure that Ypsilanti is a, a better and brighter place for them. Because um, as I always say, like, they're not only our future, they are now, right? These are the folks who are going to be leading us um, and, and making decisions for us going forward. And so hopefully uh, I'm able to continue to lay foundation as others did for me um, as a Black woman in office. So I guess I don't know if I should, if I can take questions or. Okay, yeah, so um, <clears throat> Mayor Brown, you um were the last you you were our last um speaker for the day and thank you so much um let me start with a question for you um and then we we do have some questions in the chat and my question is first off you are eagle <laughs> i'm an eagle yeah okay. <laughs> there's that long battle eagle here on eagle here on anyway um no that's not my question my question is how does it feel being the youngest mayor? You know, um, it, do people tell you that, do people say, hey, you know, you're, you're too young to be a mayor. Yeah. They yeah. Sure? <laughs> oh yeah, when I was campaigning, um, I had a couple of folks who were just like, you? I mean, I don't have anything against you, but aren't you a little young? And I'm like, well, number one, I probably, I'm not as young as I look, but I am young. 
Um, and I, <laughs> and I don't I, crack. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I would just tell them that, you know, I know that I have the strengths and capabilities to serve in this role. I have the experience. I was also the youngest council member ever elected to Atlanta City Council as well yeah. um, eight years ago. And there was a lot that I feel like I had to fight through to prove that I had the juice really to be there. But I think that, you know, I'm about action and showing and proving. And so folks who have thoughts or ideas that don't align with like, you know, maybe me being there, my my hope is to to bring them on over to the other awesome. side of showing them through, you know, my work and what I my commitment. Awesome. Good job. So as mayor, what is your highest priority? I know you have several, but what is the highest priority? My highest priority would probably still be around affordable and attainable housing because we just know how important that is um, for, for people to be able to live and to thrive. I mean, our housing stock is, is low and it's really competitive as far as like the, the price and the expense in going up. And so we have to provide spaces for people to be able to live. I mean, to me, when your basic needs are not met, you can't do anything else. And housing is a basic, a, a completely basic need. Yeah, I agree with you. Okay, one last question. Then I'm gonna turn it over to Teresa. I think she, she's fielding some questions in the chat. Okay. But my question has to do with what is causing the housing issue there in Ypsilanti? I know here in Ann Arbor, we just had a resolution, a, a, um, we just had an ordinance where uh, we passed an ADU. Do you guys have that in Ypsilanti? The uh, accessory dwelling units where people like myself who live in bi-levels, we could turn our a portion of our house into a rental portion. Do you guys, are they doing that in, in Ypsilanti? So actually that is in the process. Um, we have, so our former council member, Brian Jones Chance was working, working on that. Um, and we did approve them last year. And so that is that is an option now in Ypsilanti that was not for many, many years. It used to be way back in the day and he, was, he used to talk about how when he was growing up, how his grandparents would like rent out parts of their house. And so that mm -hmm. is available again in Ypsilanti. And that's another piece that we were working on to make sure that we have you know availability. I think the other piece is just that like housing is so expensive. And so as folks are getting priced out of neighboring communities, they're looking in Ypsilanti and then it makes it more competitive and it increases, yeah. you know, the, the price. And we are limited. Ypsilanti is very small. So we don't have yes. space to build out like, you know, new developments, which is why Water Street is a number one top priority um, for, for me and the rest of council to get developed with housing. Because that is the last piece of vacant property that we own that we can do something with. Wow. Okay, well, good. We're, we're probably going to call on you again. Next month, we're going to be talking about housing. Oh. All right, Teresa, take it away. I'm going to look at some of the questions in there, too, and we can tag to you. Okay, great. And I want to tell you, everybody, we've been dealing with a racist troll who's been um, messaging hosts and panelists, and that's why chat has kind of been in and out. So sorry about that. Um, he seems to be gone right now, but if chat goes away again, that's why. So just so use Q&A. Um, or raise your hands. We'll try to get to people with hands raised. I'll see if that works. Um, right now, I can only see hosts and panelists, but we'll see. So um, Crystal Dupree asked, um, and this is for all of you, uh, when you when you say you support your local, that we should support our local electives, especially Black folks, uh, what does that support look like? Anyway. <laughs> Uh, let me kick it off where you going, Arian. Go ahead, Justin. Well, I, you know, I would start by saying uh, it would be great if we heard from all of you more, like all of us. Well, Arian doesn't do this because you guys don't have to get public comment. But we get public comment and the city gets public comment. And, uh, you know, we, the board of commissioners, we've been getting a lot of flack um, uh, about us investing in the violence and eruption work. This is just an example. Um, and if you all value the kind that kind of work and any of the other things that we're doing, uh, it's also good to make your voices heard in a positive way. Uh, I think very often the the party's position is like we get we help get people elected, and then you trust that we go out there and do good stuff, which is great, and, and for the most part we do. Uh, but it's also helpful to have support and uh, for you to pay attention to the things that we're doing. Um, and and you know t engage with us because if you want to see certain kinds of policies in place, uh, you know we all have this relationship and it's a political relationship because we're talking <laughs> at the you know the party. But from a policy perspective, it's just helpful to be engaged and to make your voices heard. 
Yeah, Jerry. No, I'll, 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 um, Ariane was, was next. I'll, I'll wait for her. Okay, sure. The, That's you me. sure? Okay. <laughs> I don't, um, so let me just piggyback on what uh, Commissioner Hodge said. Um, we have to lean into stuff that we say is important. So, for example, when, um, when Judge Bernstein made his comments relative to the hiring of uh, a formerly incarcerated young man who did his time, turned his life around, got his law degree, and was appropriate, not just appropriate, from what everything I've seen, perfect for that position, and he chimes up, and now he's on his apology tour, and he backs up. That's great. And everybody in the, the WCDP and elsewhere rallied, right? Called him to it. But when the county invested, whatever they invested, in the violence interruption with formerly justice-involved folks who aren't perfect and all the things that go along with it, and the criticism came, some of it so wrong that it had to be corrected in a boardroom that a lot of what's being said is inaccurate. It was silence. So we spoke up because I'll tell you what, we sent a message when nobody said anything, when nobody leaned in. And I also say the targets were people of color in positions of uh, decision making that moved that agenda and then there was silence. So I'm not saying, look, you don't have to co-sign everything that we do. You may have a fundamental disagreement with what we do. I'm good with that. We may be wrong. I'm good with that. But when we are right and on the right side of things, the silence is deafening and, and that is really concerning to me. Because it's not just the people in position in these positions that make things happen for our community. It's all of us collectively rowing in the same direction that makes a difference in our community. That's really so important. And I, I, I actually, you answered um, my first question, which was, would you want that support publicly or uh, privately? And to me, it sounds like both. <laughs> like, it'd be nice to hear from us as individuals that like, thank you for all the incredible work that you're doing. But also, it needs to be public. Um, I'm, I'm happy. I know that the co-chairs of our um, communications committee are on the, the meeting and the meeting and you guys, if you want to speak up, say do um, so we can help get the word out about the kind of support you guys need. What's the best way to stay current with everything that you're doing that you want us to be aware of and standing up for? Well, so one thing, uh, you know, we spend the beginning of all of these meetings hearing from a bunch of elected officials. And then we hear from them, but there's not really anything that happens from that. I think giving updates via the newsletter, um, the social media, like all of that's really helpful because you get to hear you get to hear from all of us about the things that are important to us and the work that we're trying to do and get done. Uh, sharing that out beyond that, I know we've talked about expand, expanding the amount of time we spend on those kinds of conversations in the beginning. So I think it'd be easier uh, to share that information once we put more time into that. Okay. Other thoughts. So here in this forum, but this is just monthly. So we really want to be on top of it more than, you know, more currently than that. What other suggestions do you guys have? Well, there's the new, I mean, stuff we do gets covered by the news. Yeah, the newsletter. Uh, the, yeah. We put out press releases all the time. I mean, the sheriff's office does too. Uh, uh -huh. The board does. So all of that. I mean, if we okay. had people on the team that are following that kind of information. Okay. Follow the feeds. Okay. Anything else? Oh, wait, Janet, speak. Well, just saying I was having the exact same thought <clears throat> about how do we keep up with it, but it's, at the same time, we are a volunteer organization and those communication channels for the moment really depend on not very many people. And it's almost a full-time job for us to follow everybody. <laughs> so maybe we should work on setting up a direct thing like with things where you'd like us to mobilize support really just call our attention if you if you have people who can do that. Janet, that's such an important point. I see heads nodding. It's like, you, can you do that? Feed us, feed us and maybe feed. Um, Janet, who can, what's the best way for them to, should they write to individual members of the comms team or, um, and Tom, I know Tom and Rosanita are also on the call um, in the meeting. Well, I think we, we do have the comms at washingtonadems.org. There you but go. Like this, it might be a little bit more, I don't know. Uh, let's, let's let, let's, for the moment, let's say that. And then okay. Tom and Rosanita figure out what they would like to do if they, if we want to have any more slightly privileged, higher, higher level channels. Okay. 
So Judge Slate was going to say something earlier. Uh, I don't want to lose whatever oh. you were thinking. It's, this briefly, one of the things I think in terms of support is uh, let us let the torch not die out with those who are in office now. Um, so if you are interested in supporting people who share the vision that we currently have on our boards and commissions, um, we need to start recruiting. Um, <laughs> we need to be recruiting now because <laughs> um, you know elections are just around the corner again. They always yeah. are. And um, I think one of the biggest support is that we're not alone in our missions. I mean, we see that when um, we a majority swings in either direction. And then when we lose it, it's like, oh, holy smokes, what are we going to do? Um, so we need to prepare for those vacancies now um, and we need to rally today. So um, I always try to ask, what have I done today? Um, I, you know, we can't rely on history. Uh, we remember it. We can't rely on it. Yeah, that's great. And I want to I want to announce that we're going to be the executive board. Justin, this is OK, right, is going to be um, asking the county committee to and a lot of you may not under, know what the county committee is because it seems a little obscure, not the county board of commissioners but the county committee for the Washington County Democratic Party. But we're going to be um, asking for the approval of a new standing committee on, in fact, on candidate recruitment and support. And part of the charge of that committee is to look ahead and to make sure that so we know, you know, we know what's coming open. We know in every position in the county that we know what's coming open. We know and we have our an eye on who we want to nominate and mentor for those roles. Um, so that's that's coming up, which I think is really important and great. I think it'd be really helpful and something I was going to add or mention in my remarks earlier about we're in a really good spot with the work that we do at the county with our board of commissioners. And you don't have to look that far in the news to see how it could go. All this work could swing in a different kind of direction. If you look at Ottawa County, like in Ottawa County, oh people have been following what's been going on there. Um, you know, they should not have swung so far right in the way that they did. Uh, so for people that know, don't know, they ended up electing several far right Trump Republicans to their board of commissioners. And then in their first meeting, which is usually just the organizational meeting where you, you know, elect the, um, the chair and vice chair and so on. Um, they did all that stuff, but then they also fired their county administrator, fired their public health officer, uh, voted to dissolve their diversity, equity, and inclusion office and changed the, um, the county's motto from a place where we belong to let freedom ring. Um, and then, and, oh, and then the person that they hired as their county administrator is a former Trump administration appointee who ran for Congress and lost. So they, you know, Ottawa County is not that red, but I don't think people were paying attention to the, that election cycle. And now it is that red. And a really important point on that for our organizational thinking is that, um, you know, I think a lot of people just didn't see it coming. And we have really, really good people here, including uh, Darcy Berwick on, you know, who's very, very attuned to what's going on in school boards and just people all over the county, Jennifer Fairfield on the in the West and uh, Kathy Watt on the right, who really have, have we have our ears to the ground about what's going on. And we can we can head this kind of thing off of the past. But I think having this standing committee is going to be super, super important and helpful. The last thing I'll right. say on this and then turn it over, but Doug put in the chat, like show up to these meetings and give public comment. That's really important. And I would say that's probably extra important in some of the areas in Western Washtenaw. Um, at some of the school board meetings, there's a group that's been organized that has been showing up and trying to get them to ban certain books. Uh, and you get a lot of people showing up and giving public comment on that, but there's not people on the other end doing that. So just, we, we have to pay attention to that kind of thing and then get people to show up because what they're trying to do is pressure that school board to do something they don't want to do. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also been threats of violence. So, you know, we have to show up and be able to support people in those spaces, too. Yeah, it's so important. That's interesting. And We've gotten dangerous. a little complacent. Yeah, Loretta, go. It's dangerous to show up, <clears throat> Justin. So, it, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons people don't want conflict. So as a result, you know, they hear that, you know, this other group is um, going there looking for a fight. So how do you, I mean, do we show up with, with uh, Sheriff Clayton? What do we do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you probably don't want me specifically, <laughs> but I, I think there is a, some value in coordinating. So if, if, if there is concern, 
um, for safety at those meetings, um, there's value in those elected officials coordinating with whoever their local public safety folks are. And you can have a subdued presence just to ensure that the people's business gets taken care of in the safest way. So I would put this out to, to this group. If you if you know about those situations that you think is hampering democracy because one group can't contribute, you let us know so we can help just clear that path. Okay, that's a good point. Okay, there are some questions in the um, in the chat that I wanted to address, and one of them was, hang on, uh, it asked a question. I just had it. Okay, are we on the media list of the legislator's office and sheriff's department? Did you guys answer that question? Or maybe that's a question for you, Sheriff Clayton. I think that's more of an internal question. That's for that's for our comms team to get on those media lists. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, we okay. need to do that. Yeah, right. for us, I, I'm sorry, for us, I'll just really quick, I'll say you got the inside track. You have Kathy Wyatt on your team. <laughs> if things <laughs> are going on internally, I Kathy on. So that's I would always go to her even before you came to me. She's in the middle. <laughs> I agree, she's phenomenal. I so agree. Okay, this is a question for everybody. What responsibilities do you believe you have to advocate, lead on issues specific to African-American population? And we can start with um, Mayor Nicole Brown. I think that I have, I mean, I have a commitment to, to do that. I think that the, there's no way to separate the fact that like, that I am a black woman in this role from the work. Um, and anyone who says different, I, I would challenge them to, to reconsider that, that type of statement. I think it's important to make sure that in everything that I'm doing, I'm thinking about my community. We've been, especially in Ypsilanti, if you think about um, you know, the history of the South side of Ypsilanti being left out of conversations, being underrepresented, um, Ypsilanti as a whole um, not being represented well, um, in a lot of spaces. And I think it's it's literally my job to make sure that my blackness is at the forefront of the work that I'm doing while I'm also representing everyone that, that's within the community. I don't think there's any way that you can separate the two. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Good answer. Okay, Judge Lay, can you answer that question? Sure, I think uh, for me, uh, cause I'm not, uh, in the community in a traditional way, like many of the other electeds on here. Um, but I do have uh, community contacts with probably about 500 people a week who come through my family or for my courtroom, whether they um, have a case involving a divorce or child custody, if they have a criminal case, if they're supporting a loved one, if they're a victim of a crime. And for me, it's just giving that place and space and for everyone that having the opportunity to be heard. Um, I have some great colleagues on my bench uh, with me right now. And so that has been exceedingly helpful, but I am also a member of the Black Judges Association. And I, this is something actually kind of beautiful. I just have to like share it. Normally when you go to new judge school, there's like two or three non-white new judges. Like there's been five, up to five I've heard um, in past years. And there were 21 of us at this last new judge school. And just like the, it was a kind of a, um, from that perspective, it was the first time in my professional career where I had been supported by a whole bunch of other uh, black attorneys, now judges coming up together and sharing this experience. It was kind of amazing. But in that, you know, we've, I have, we got a group chat, of course, uh, going on and we've been texting and keeping in contact, but um, not every community has that strong support from their colleagues on the bench. Uh, <laughs> As, as one can imagine across the state of Michigan, not everyone has, you know, uh, Carol Kunke or, you know, Tracy Vandenberg or Pat Conlon. They don't have those people in their community. So we need to, um, you know, remember that Washtenaw is doing pretty good where other places are really struggling. I think the responsibility, too, is to, um, you know, let people know what's going on in other communities, too, so we can, when we have the opportunity to lead by example. Um, and I, I, like Nicole said, you can't separate um, the woman from the job. And so I am a black woman. I'm a black mama. I'm a black attorney. I, I, you know, and this is what I am when I am in court. Um, I think the some of the staff they, they're not really used to. I don't know if you guys have seen the skip black lady courtroom. It 
it, it yeah. is a black lady courtroom when you come in. And I, I think some of the staff are kind of like taken because they're, they're not um, maybe used to the delivery. Um, and, and, but at the same time, I think um, there's a connection that I'm having with people that seems authentic. Um, so I'm going to keep being me and that's my responsibility is to be me and to follow the law. So combining those two things together, I think that's the best way I continue to serve. I think that's so adorable. <laughs> what did you call it? Judge school? Judge, judge school. It's uh, judge school. Judge school is fantastic. I'm going to drop a picture in the chat so you guys can see how fantastic <laughs> judge school looks. It was really fun. That's so cool. All right. what, I, what I think is adorable is a black lady courtroom idea. Yeah, that too. I, I want to see that. <laughs> I saw a picture of that one time, black lady courtroom. It was awesome. Yeah, HBO, HBO skit. I'll tell you, and I, the, the make it full circle. Um, the, and my, all my years of practice, um, you know, 99% of the time, I was probably the only black person in the courtroom um, who came to work. Um, and, you know, except for when I would have that benefit of coming in front of Judge Simpson, um, especially in my early days, the only people who looked like me or black folks were coming there as defendants. Yeah. And so um, yeah. it's, we need to make sure that that trend is uh, is on gone. Yeah, I agree. Uh, maybe apropos about a gone with wind, y'all. <laughs> Extra gone. I agree. Commissioner Justin. Will you speak to that issue? Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I mean, I, I agree. Uh, I echoed the same statements. The other thing I would I would add to it, though, is that if we aren't in these spaces and we're not uh, promoting those values and those kinds of policies, we have history to look at to see what kinds of policies other elected officials will make. I mean, historically, most elected officials have been white men, and we see the arc of history and uh, the kinds of policies that uh, many of us are fighting against now. So that's another key space and reason why representation matters. And also, you know, you think about kids that are growing up now and they can look at the elected officials in Washtenaw County, black and brown kids and say, hey, I can do that too. I mean, that's so that's really critical. What does it look like in the county commissioner's environment? Is it is it black man county commissioner? Well, I mean, it's we're majority minority board. So, you know, okay. I'm, I'm the chair. Caroline Sanders is our vice chair. So we have uh, a black man and a black woman as the chair and the vice chair. Uh, so, yeah, we're a majority minority board. Awesome. Good deal. And All I, right. I was going to jump. So city council is majority minority and majority women as well right now, too. So this is like we're making history in a lot of ways. Awesome. <laughs> OK, Sheriff. What's going on in your environment? Uh, I, you know, I, I think the mayor and the judge and, and the chair all really just covered it in a, in a good way. I, I will just add, we also have to go outside of our own spaces. Um, similar to what the judge said in terms of spending most of her career in places where she's the only one that looks like her. I spent my entire 35 years like that, um, both locally and nationally. And although you may, I mean, the, and you have to speak up. And you have to have that other point of view in your official capacity and in the other things that that, that you do. Um, I remember uh, just really, really quickly um, teaching a, a biased policing class in um, Arkansas. And I thought that was going to be the challenge, but I actually taught it in Champaign, Illinois. And the first day was so bad of the pushback. I called my wife and said, here's where I am. Here's the hotel I'm staying at. So if you don't hear from me, you know, but my point is in that class, they were pushing back against all the basic things about how you treat people and, and, and you know, what is probable cause for stops and all that kind of stuff. And we have to be in those spaces to say, no, that's not it. This is what the truth is. This is what the law is. And if we do it the other way, here's how our people are hurt. And I reject any argument that people will say when folks like us advocate for us, that we're advocating against others. We're not. No. We're at, I can advocate for people that look like me because I love people that look like me. And it doesn't mean I'm not for other folks. Because exactly. when we elevate ourselves, we are elevating other folks. So right. I think that's just. And it doesn't mean that we're black nationalists either that, you know, because we're advocating for us, you know? And so, yeah, I, I appreciate that very much. Um, okay, Janet had a follow-up question and she says, um, uh, 
do other Black electeds find opportunities for exchange and mentorship? Similar to what Judge Slay mentioned. I'd, I'd say yes. I mean, no, I don't think anybody accidentally gets elected. I mean, there's like a lot of work that happens leading up to that and, you know, interacting in spaces like this. So I would say you're going to be interacting with uh, a lot of people that are in, in the space. Um, like I, I would count Sheriff Clayton as a mentor of mine. Uh, so I would say yes. The answer is yes to that question. And I, I would also add there are actual like organized spaces for that. So when I first got elected to city council in 2014, um, people for the American Way have this young elected officials network. And I was encouraged to join that. And once I joined that, there's a black caucus. Um, and so I'm still connected, kind of like Judge Slay was saying, her group chat. I'm connected to all these young black electeds from across the nation that we, we chat, we share information, we share legislation that we want to work on in our different communities. And um, that has really uplifted me and actually helped me in so many ways throughout my years on city council and even in you know my campaign and run to, um, to be mayor. So there are definitely spaces out there um, that are organized as well as just within our community. I think Sheriff Clayton, I mean, Justin, you know, Ariane, like folks, we, we talk to each other, we, we support one another. And even in that there's mentorship, even when we are, you know, just in our close in age, but he's mentored me in certain ways. We've talked about different things. And so that's really a blessing to be able to have like like-minded colleagues that also can, you know, act as mentors to you as well in real time. Okay. Anybody else want to speak to that? Then I have another uh, question, and it um, it's uh, with respect to the work of county government. Um, can you speak to why representation is so critical? I think that's for you, Justice. Justin. I think that's for me. I think the sheriff could also answer that question, though, too. Uh, okay. I, I would circle back to. Uh, the point I made earlier about us being able to be in a space where we're going to form a reparations advisory council that I expect will be that we will pass unanimously. Uh, not all counties are talking about uh, work like that. So that's something to be celebrated. And, uh, and when we think about uh, when we had this conversation about having all of you show up to support the work that your elected officials are doing, that's an area where I think it would be great to receive a lot of uh, public comment in favor of us doing that, if that's a thing that, that's uh, important to you. Awesome. Sheriff? Only because you said something. I, again, I think um, the chair covered it. Uh, and, you know, just my piggyback on the mentor thing, that works both ways, right? So everybody thinks about us old folks being the ones that are the mentors. But we learned from that generation that, that has followed us. So how Justin has has led the commission and now with Caroline leading the commission, how now Nicole is the mayor of MC. I was I just, I, I'm so excited just listening to them. You learn to think differently, right? Broaden your horizon. Cause there I've had conversations with them and, and I think I have vision around stuff, right? And I've got some experience, but I walk away from conversations around them said, I didn't even think about that. Holy cow. So I think that goes both ways. It's just sometimes the conversation just makes us better. Okay. Good deal. Okay, um, so so to to sort of um, expand that, what would you guys say needs to happen to ensure that diversity um, on the board of all government officials continues? What what needs to happen for that? Judge Slade, you want to start? I think I'm just going to go back to recruitment now. Like, if you want people in places and spaces that are um, representative of the ideals that you believe in, regardless of what they look like on the outside, we are most concerned with what's in their heart and if they are doers. And if you know somebody who is on that cusp of thinking that they may run for office, now's the time. <laughs> it might be, it's, now's the time. Like, we, um, you know, and I hope that we encourage. Um, People and you know we, the um, the Black Caucus does a um, like a leadership academy for new candidates or people who are considering. I think one of the most important things that we can do to support them is to be honest about our journeys and to be honest about the road that it is. Because I I know we all had different experiences getting to the positions that we're in, but they were really, for the most part. I think the one thing that we have that's um, in common is it wasn't easy. 
um, probably for any elected official, but there's additional barriers. Um, I think when you're a person of color, especially in Washtenaw County, that you don't encounter, um, you know, calling the police on you when you're campaigning, the stuff of you're not smart enough or good enough, you know, the the lack of access sometimes just places and spaces that we haven't been in just to even do the introductions, um, the threats, the nasty letters, you, one has to be prepared for those things when they are stepping into a role of potential service. And I think we don't do ourselves any favors if we're one, not honest about it. And two, um, we don't plan to overcome those obstacles. Um, and so I feel like I, um, running the, for the second time, I was more aware of the toll it was going to take on me emotionally, the toll and the fear that was going to come into the homes for my, for my family, um, too. And so we need, we need to be very honest about those things. Um, and I think that's how we get, um, cause when you, people start to run or they put their name out there and then they start hearing like, maybe like the chatter that makes them feel uncomfortable and they quickly step back. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we can prepare people and we can say that we're going to support you and we're here for the long haul, I think that's how we get more people into these spaces. Let me ask a follow-up. How do you prepare? I mean, how would you prepare somebody for, um, running for an office where they're being challenged because they think differently, they look differently. Well, for me, it was my faith is a huge part of like, that's what I always go back to and I rely on. That's going to be different for everybody. Um, but my father-in-law says something that um, I think is apropos for everyone who's in that situation is that your condition is not your conclusion. Um, and I say that um, probably five or six times a week, even on my criminal docket, um, when you know I'm having to sentence people who you know, they're going on probation, they might be going to jail. And they're like, you have this, gosh, this is so hard. And this is looking so bad. And it's doom and gloom. We we can do better, we will do better. And a lot of that is mindset and showing up that like the troops are there to support you, um, that the community is here to support you. Um, so if you haven't thought, let, let it sink in and right, your condition right now is not your conclusion. Um, and so that's kind of the advice that I try to give every week. Um, I'm open to a new line because I think the tagline is going to get played out soon, but I really believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Commissioner. Uh, so I would say the recruitment piece is really important, letting people know, hey, you can do this. Uh, but the honesty that the honesty component of it that Judge Slade mentioned is critical, right? It's not a uh, fun and games and all rosy kind of thing that you're doing. It's, it's tough. And the those barriers that she mentioned are real. Like right? people will, you might be going door to door. People might call the police on you. Like that, that's like a thing that happens. Uh, so it's tough they call to. Police I mean, on you. Oh yeah, they yeah, call, I mean, they happen. They call, I was, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, Jerry, did they call him? What they call? There's some suspicious black folks in my neighborhood. They're wearing yep. matching T-shirts and they have a Chrysler Pacifica minivan. Like they're putting things on our door that say "running for judge." What's suspicious about them? Well, I don't have any black people in my neighborhood. <laughs> that that kind of thing does hey. happen. Like, and yeah. then they come out, you know, like, hey, we're sorry, we got to respond. Are you guys doing okay? The last time it happened was like a week before this last election for me. And the officers were really nice. And they're like, hey, do you want a bottled water? We have a bottled water in here. <laughs> so they were really nice about it. But, you know, that's I maybe five or six times the campaign season for me was average. And that kind of thing takes a toll on you. I mean, even if, you know, the outcome is fine, like you, you get a bottle of water out of it, but it still takes a toll on you. So, um, and then the other piece about you recruit a person and Kathy put some of this in the chat, you got to support them all the way through. Like once they put their name on the ballot, yeah. that doesn't mean, okay, job's done. I don't have to do anything to help. Uh, campaigns are expensive. It takes right. a lot of money. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's that. It's no one wants to knock on doors generally. Like it's hard to recruit people that will be committed to knocking on doors. So uh, that's critical too. So it's not just a matter of recruitment. It's recruit the person, but then you have to support them all the way through um, election day and then after. That's a good point. Very good point. Yeah, I agree with you. Sure. Do you have anything to add to that? It sounds like they might have covered the whole basis. <laughs> What about you, Mayor? Um, they did cover bases. The only thing that I would add is something that I talked about a lot while I was campaigning around reminding folks in recruitment that you don't have to be like this cookie cutter politico who went to school for political science or whatever the case may be to decide to get involved in this way. Um, and so that's one of the things that when I'm working with young people even, 
I'm letting them know, like, this was not the path that I saw myself on. I, I did not know how being a social worker would intersect with being in, in politics. I don't call myself a politician, but I am a social justice worker. And so that is the lens that I take when I'm doing this work. And so making sure that our young folks too that are coming up recognize that like you can you can pivot and do this in whatever space that you're in. Um, because you again, like Ariane said, you have to have a heart for the people and a heart for the work. It doesn't really matter what your degree is in or what your background's in um, to do this. And I think that will help with recruitment, honestly, because I think people think that you have to be this particular type of person to get into this work and that's not the case. I agree. Do you guys think that because of our environment, social justice portion of it, I hear what you're saying about when we have two um, social workers, um, social justice, the, the um, underlining or has it bubbled up to the top and become the most prominent piece of being a politician now? What would you say? Go ahead. Well, I, I would say it should have always been that. I mean, when we're talking about addressing the affordable housing crisis, that's a social justice issue. When we're talking about food insecurity, uh, you know, helping people's financial health, those are all social justice issues. So, uh, I mean, the way that we've structured our society is that politics is how we disperse power throughout our communities. And we need people that are in positions of power to really care about and advance social justice issues. It seems so like you have to be a social justice advocate in order to be a politician now. Well, or, I mean, if you're on the other side of the aisle, kind of, you know, trying to roll things in the opposite direction. <laughs> that's, that's, that's very true. Okay, I agree. All right. Um, okay, we have, <clears throat> we have about nine minutes. And I wanted to use this time to ask... Uh, some questions that are a little bit more fun, if you guys don't mind. Uh, one of the questions is, um, what was the fondest memory of you becoming um, the first in your industry, in your in your chosen field? What was your fondest memory? So, so I'll start really quick and say, you know, I was fortunate enough to be elected in the same election that President Obama was elected, his first election. Um, obviously, you know, just that in and of itself was just, it was just amazing. Um, and I think it helped because I thought less about um, my election and more about the fact that we had elected an African-American president. So that was, that was just, for me, that was the fondest thing that sticks out for me. Awesome. And you were elected four times. Man, that's amazing. People really like you. Um, I'm not sure if I have a, a, a fondest memory of one I could just pinpoint, but I think something that I could share is when it like really hit me. Um, so after uh, the election, I uh, started a little bit earlier um, than January. So I'm moving in uh, one Saturday and um, carrying boxes and, you know, whatever. And uh, my son sees like, you know, um, kid gold, a vending machine at the top of the steps, right? So like, you can't pass a vending machine without a kid who's like, mom, look, M&Ms, you know? So we have to stop at the vending machine. So he's standing there making his decision and, you know, milling over whatever's going to be. And next to the vending machine, there is a plaque in the courthouse of all of the judges according to seat, um, and the thing that it hit me was that I was in what's called seat one, which is the longest running seat in Washtenaw County. And it was, um, you know, 16 prior judges in this seat and that my name was going to be up there. Black lady up there. Hey, black, there'll be a black lady up here in seat one. And I was like, I wonder how some of these other folks would have felt about this if they knew this 200 years ago. I laughed a lot for, you know, a second, and then we got the M&Ms and kept it moving. But that's just one of those moments where it kind of like hit me um, again. So. Awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so, I think I would say um, probably on the day. So we get sworn in like six days after the election. And so um, less than a week later, in in council chambers being sworn in but watching my my younger brother be sworn in is my fondest memory because my choice to vacate my seat 
to run for mayor um, opened up an opportunity for another first. So my brother is now the youngest black male um, and the youngest person who's man who's run and won a council seat. And so it was less about me and more about him for me that my decision to, to do this, um, cause we're about almost 10 years apart in age. So my decision to do this work, I didn't ask him to do this. He, he decided he wanted to get involved um, in this way based on, you know, watching me. And that to me is the, the most important and like the fondest memory that I have and I probably will always have is watching him take his oath of office. That's awesome. As the mayor. Yeah. That's that's super awesome. Yes. Yeah, that was a great that was a great day. I was in the front row. I think I recorded him. If you need a video of him being sworn in, I think I recorded that. Uh, so I'll add, I'm, so I'm not the first, I'm just putting that, you know, asterisk out there. I'm not the first, but I would say that the day that we were all sworn in, we don't, we get sworn in in January. So not six days after the election. Um, so since the pandemic, we don't usually have a ton of people that come to the board of commissioner chambers and give comment, um, unless there's a protest against us, which does happen from time to time. Uh, but for this meeting, the room was packed, uh, and it was filled with joy. It was so many people that were there to see us and, to be sworn in. A lot of people gave great comments. Nicole's dad sang a song to Commissioner Somerville. Uh, it was it was just a beautiful day to be able to share joy with so many people. That is so cool. How 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 do we know? I mean, I would like to attend some of these swearing ins and stuff. How do we get on the calendar to know when this is happening? I mean, they, they just happen during when the regular meeting happens after an election. So like board of commissioners, we meet the first and third Wednesdays of each month. Um, so then at the first one of, after the election, uh, that's when we get sworn in. In the city, they get sworn in at the first meeting after the election. So six days after the election. Uh, yeah, we got to share when the meeting times are, get that information to the yes. party so we can, because uh, sometimes we have a good time at our meetings. Like I try to run a fun meeting. We did. Okay. We did get a notice of a number of these swearings in, and I know many people did go, but uh, we were a little shorthanded in terms of volunteers for being able to spread the word much more widely. You know, we tried to post on Facebook when we could, but there just aren't enough. So if you if you as listeners would like to get more information of this type, we could definitely use some help. Volunteer at WashingtonDems.org. Yeah, <laughs> we need you. We need you. Yes. Yeah. All right. So I'm, Teresa, I'm gonna, you want to take it from here? I'm, yeah, yeah, last thank minutes. you. Loretta, what an incredible job you've done as a MC. You've just done a fantastic job. Round of applause. Fun. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I know it's not hard managing everything. It's like being in a cockpit, you know, <laughs> yeah, like boo, 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 boo. you did great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And thanks to all of you speakers. My God, we're so, it's so inspiring and we've learned so much from you all. And as, as Sheriff Clayton said, thank you to Kathy Wyatt, who yes. pulled all this together. What yes. a fantastic job. Thank you, Kathy Wyatt. Um, who I think is in charge of the next program, right? Yes. Is that right on I, housing? I, I, yeah, we're up for another program, her and I. Yeah, dedicated to the housing crisis in Washington County. We had a few minutes on that in January, but it's a big, big problem. Yeah. Um, and you know what I hope maybe we can do is tie in Senator Irwin's work on food insecurity to that meeting as well, because that is huge and there are stupid, unnecessary obstacles to um, accessing food assistance that we need to take care of. So, um with that, I think it's time to sign off. Loretta, you good? I'm good. Again, uh, thank you, everyone, for spending your Saturday with us. We will see you again. We will be in touch. Happy Saturday. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Great job. <laughs>